Hey, it's me, guy who made a 10 minute analysis video of literally every single episode of Steins Gate. A few months ago, I had a revelation. Wait a second, other anime exist? Then I had another revelation. Wait a second, other time travel anime exist? So naturally, I watched all of them and then time leaped here to rank them. Are any of them better than Steins Gate? Well, uh, considering how many of them just blatantly rip off Steins Gate, uh, no. But maybe some of them come pretty close, eh? Three rules before we begin. One, at least half the anime labeled time travel aren't actually time travel anime, they're isekai in disguise, so we're skipping them. This means no Inyasha, no Dr. Stone, that kind of thing. Nothing wrong with them, they just aren't about time travel. But everything else is fair game. Two, nothing where time travel is just a science story or a sequel on a really long series. Like, yeah, there's time travel Naruto movies and stuff, but the story as a whole isn't about time travel, so let's just skip those. Three, I had to watch all of every anime on this list. None of this, ooh, I streamed for four hours watching trailers and then made a video saying I watched every anime. None of this, I watched the first three episodes and then decided if it's good. Pussy shit. I watched everything. All right, enough wasting. <clears throat> Time. I left a timestamp for every tier, but F tier should be pretty self-explanatory. So let's go ahead and start with the single worst time travel anime ever made. Mirai no Mirai. I honestly thought I would have liked the time travel anime that's just the word future twice, but I guess it's kind of fitting that it gets to be the first one we talk about because Mirai no Mirai is fucking shit. Now, unlike every other anime I've placed in F tier, when I say this is shit, I don't mean it's incompetently written with horrible characters, because it isn't. What I mean is I'm baffled by how unfathomably bad an idea this story was in the first place, because out of all the horrible anime I watched to make this list, this is the only one that was actually physically painful to watch. Mirai no Mirai succeeds at everything it tries to do in the worst way possible because the story is basically insufferable little shit is an insufferable little shit for an hour and a half. I almost wanted to get a vasectomy after watching this until I realized I no longer needed one because it also made my balls shrivel up in disgust. Literally the only people I can imagine liking this movie are women actively trying to get pregnant because everyone else would just want to tear their eyes and ears out and never even so much as look at children again, let alone have them after seeing this. God damn. Island. Moving on to the actual worst time travel anime, Island. It's one thing for an anime to be chunk full of generic wife of bullshit, and it's another when it does this because it thinks you're too stupid for anything else. Like, I shit you not, there's a moment three episodes into Island, where the main character pulls out a diary of everything that's happened so far and just throws up his hands and is like, wow, the plot is so confusing, isn't it? Bitch, we're not even an hour in and you've spent 40 minutes showing me underage girls in bikinis. What could possibly be confusing? Not that there's anything inherently wrong with an anime calling you stupid, it's just that being smart itself is kind of a prerequisite, and this just lays down an hour of the most boring, lazy, generic writing I've ever seen before bending over and sucking its own dick. Like, the first thing that happens in this anime is a girl falling on the main character's naked crotch. As a general rule, if this is how an anime starts, run far away. Even if it's somehow still good, you'll only be disappointed. So the plot basically is this dude, Setsuna, washes up on a beach, again, naked, with no memories, only a vague feeling feeling that he's supposed to save a girl. Oh, and also kill someone, which is the one idea that saves us from being the single most generic thing I have ever seen. But any tension it ever had just completely goes out the window with a protagonist who's so dull he barely even reacts to anything going on around him. When the lolly tries to kill him, he just kinda goes, eh? and shrugs it off before stumbling upon the basement where he opens a random book to find a note saying that he has to die. And then he just kind of goes off to bed without a care like it's Stripper Tuesday. How does your character receive two death threats in one episode and not bat an eye? And then, and you're not gonna believe this, but you know the thing about him killing someone? The one actually interesting detail about the plot? Turns out, that was a lie. I'm serious, it just casually discards this halfway through and is like, oh yeah, so that's not a thing. Who the hell 
wrote this? Apparently, not anyone who cares, because halfway through, it turns into an entirely different anime that ends with sets in a fucking a 13. No, no, oh my god, no, 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 burn it down, no, no, shit, fuck. Thought it was weird that he's supposed to be 20 when all the girls are 16? Yeah, no, you were wrong, idiot. The saddest part is that Island has good ideas, but then it just kind of casts them all aside for whatever this bullshit is. Like, in literally the last episode, it just casually brings up that time travel doesn't exist, and all the characters are instead being frozen in time and waking up in the future, but it feels like the past because the world is on a series of repeating loops. That's interesting, that's genuinely interesting, but then it immediately forgets about it and the show just ends. Huh? Oh, and where did Setsuna come from in the first place? Uh, apparently we forgot about this one too. It's actually impressive just how thoroughly this story manages to go absolutely nowhere. Easily one of the most appallingly bad anime I've ever seen. F. DNA 2. Okay, wait, hold up. I have a feeling this next one is gonna set off YouTube's demonetization Gestapo, so just pretend I'm swearing like a schoolgirl trying to impress her older boyfriend as she gets bent over and railed behind the gym for the first time as we employ the power of tangential rhyming. DNA 2 is what happens when a group of dudes successfully pitch a hilarious idea they came up with after getting blackout drunk at a karaoke bar, then spent the advance on hookers and blow before sitting down the day before the deadline and realizing that none of them know how to fucking write. I mean, you think the anime about a guy who zucks so many girls, he literally single-handedly causes the overpopulation of the world and throws the future so into chaos that the government has to go back in time and stop him from zucking a hundred girls would be an easy slam dunk, but they somehow actually screwed this up. Maybe that last part clued you into what's wrong with this though, because it's almost adorable that this anime's idea of an unimaginably large amount of sex is a hundred girls. I mean, this is the first number of 14-year-old virgin and throws out when he wants to impress his less intelligent friends. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not a virgin. In fact, I've zucked a hundred girls, so there. Oh shit, he zucked a hundred girls, word. And none of them go to our school, that's crazy. Now, I'm not saying this isn't a large number, obviously. It is, but I mean, this is the mega playboy that single-handedly caused the overpopulation of the earth. This is like a Sunday morning for Bob Marley. He zucked a hundred girls, you can't be serious. Like sure, each of his offspring zucked a hundred girls, and each of their offspring zucked a hundred girls, and so on. But the problem is, whoever wrote this clearly can't do basic math because it only takes place a hundred years in the future. Oh shit, if he zucked a hundred girls, and they each zucked a hundred girls and they each zucked a hundred girls and they each zucked a hundred girls that's like can you imagine oh my god uh a hundred million y yes I, I i can can you not in 100 years junta momonari's descendants will number 12,000. 6,000 of them are men <sighs> no no, you're right, I guess basic math was a little too much to expect. If it sounds like I'm a little hung up on this one point, it's because so little happens in it that we literally spend three episodes on a girl farting. I know that sounds funny, but trust me when I say that this entire 15 episode anime could have happened in four, and I'm including the three episode OVA in here. It eventually manages to get silly when future girl Aoi, after shooting sex machine Junta with the fake mega playboy bullet, gets the real bullet and then shoots the wrong person and then it turns out that that bullet was also wrong and now this guy turns into a DNA vampire and Junta has to become the mega playboy in order to defeat him. By the way, the mega playboy can teleport and also takes down the DNA vampire with one punch. See, this is the kind of Zuck I was expecting to see from a show with this loose of a grasp on biology, let alone simple arithmetic. But like every girl I've ever been with, it takes a full 12 episodes to get there and then moves on right away. I guess the lesson is, in a world where hentai is taken as a serious art form, it's good to stop and ask why this wasn't hentai. And that's probably because it wasn't interesting enough to be pornography. A colossal waste of a hilarious idea and a pathetic failure for everyone involved. F. Punchline. Punchline is a clever play on the made up word panty line if you're Japanese and have taken more than a few blows to the head. Oh, was I supposed to say something else? Like what? 
I'm sorry, what is this? Dude turns into a ghost and has to save the world, but it blows up every time he starts rocking a stiffy? Like, yeah, sure, that sounds amusing for about 10 seconds after this idea is introduced until we learn that he can go back in time anytime he wants as if nothing happened, because if there's anything stories have too much of, it's tension. Yeah, just go to an izakaya if the stakes are so important to you, asshole. Yet another good idea. Utterly wasted by writers with not one ounce of talent. It's not that the show is vapid, it's that it's vapid and deliberately obtuse. It refuses to explain anything as if it thinks being complicated is interesting. Except all it does is not tell you what's happening and then go, whoa, this is crazy. That's not complex or confusing, that's just obtuse. Yet for some reason it thinks it's the next coming of Steinsgate when it models time travel for us, which is literally two options the options are good and bad you don't need a fucking model bro what in search of last future is the single least self-aware anime i have ever seen case in point I mean, on one hand, it's almost refreshing to hear an anime just flat out admit that its protagonist is the most boring, unremarkable person ever, and that things only happen around him because he's the protagonist. But on the other, when someone you're hanging out with just casually lets slip that they have a problem, the correct response is very rarely to give them a 12 episode anime and a bonus hot spring episode. In Search of the Four Hours I'm Never Getting Back is about a girl who gets run over by a bus and all her friends build a time traveling robot to save her, and because of worldline divergence, this anime keeps trying to be Steinsgate over and over. Yes, the amount of time that elapsed between Steinsgate and the original game is so suspiciously close to the exact amount of time it would take to conceive and produce a visual novel, I'm almost embarrassed for the developers. But the reason In Search of Better Anime ultimately fails is that the person going back in time is an emotionally unavailable robot that has like 5 minutes of screen time, so we empathize with her about as well as a vacuum cleaner that you strapped googly eyes and a tenga cup too. Not that this would have worked with any of the other characters, all more one note than a broken shamisen. I mean, it's got all the classics. The childhood friend, the feisty girl, the foreigner that speaks 50% in random English phrases with a surprisingly thick Japanese accent. And then, of course, we have Dolkun, the dull protagonist, because the paradox of having so much pussy that it's falling out of your pockets while being as unappealing to the opposite sex as possible is somehow the most relatable and believable thing for weeb. There's good ideas here, but every part of this, including the ending animation that just gives up and stops halfway through like the entire studio clocked out early to go to the soap land, just feels so lazy and derivative of other, less terrible anime. In short, In Search of a Chair and Some Rope is not just bland, but offensively bland. Maybe not quite in the running for blandest anime ever, but at the convention hall for blandness, it'd have at least a double wide booth, and so for that, it goes right in the top of F tier. Alice. Tell me friends, do you ever struggle over the anime question? Do Chinese anime count as anime? Does a Gretzuko count as anime? I ask this because Alice is known as the first 3D anime. Why? Just because it's Japanese? Oh, never mind. Alice, no points guessing what the fuck the acronym is supposed to be, is an almost inconceivably bad film. It's usually a big red flag when you have to pirate something because you can't find anyone willing to take your money to watch something made digitally in an era when that's literally free. But it became apparent why basically the instant I turned it on. The best thing you can do is rest. Let's go back. Not only does it look like a bad PS2 game, despite coming out five years after Toy Story, the sound mixing is hilariously bad. I can't even count the number of pops and mouth clicks I heard in the audio. My YouTube videos have better audio than this, and I'm an autistic weeabo that spent the last six months watching every time travel anime ever made. Oh, big surprise, an anime with a terrible dub come the predictable comments. Well, asshole, the reason I bring this up is because I tried watching the Japanese first and it's literally worse. <laughs> Thank you.
Yeah, somehow the dub uses the same two actors doing different voices for every single character, or at least that's what it sounds like. I have no idea who dubbed this because the only English version I could find is a pirated copy that cuts out before the credits, and so far, no one has stepped up to take responsibility for this, and yet it's somehow still better than the Japanese. Although the translation is fucked. History's youngest astronaut, and also the world's greatest Japanese teen idol. I was tempted to put Alice in its own tier because, well, it's... What's the word? Failure! It's exploding track full of popcorn and fireworks kind of failure, rather than the traditional anime masturbating on a train kind of failure. So I'm not going to spoil the plot because you actually kind of have to see this, but just know that it involves time traveling to capture Hitler and take over the world instead of time traveling. And also the characters hack so hard they almost die. Can you guess when this was made? D -tier. Boring. D tier anime has just enough merit to not inspire jerking off in a hate filled rage, but also might just put you to sleep instead. In some ways, worse than F, in the sense that lighting yourself on fire and jumping off a building is at least more memorable than hanging yourself in a tiny apartment surrounded by bad anime, empty cans of Strong Zero, and the overwhelming stench of failure. Sometimes I feel like anime has become a little loose with the concept of clubs sports ball club, gardening club, nightclub club. Club, seal clubbing club. What's that? No, I'm not jerking off in the washroom. I'm doing extracurriculars for the masturbation club. But maybe Operation Sanctuary is simply trying to teach us something profound when they have the characters hang out at the cafe club. Hey, it says, if everything's a club, then nothing isn't a club. Maybe you watching profane anime reviews on the toilet is an elaborate illusion constructed by the VR club, Jeremy. Maybe we're all just part of one big after school club called life. Where was I? Oh, right. I was rambling about one irrelevant little point because Operation Sanctuary has violently little going on. I'd put it into F tier if this was a normal anime, but it just barely squeaks into D from the amazing decision of each episode only being 12 minutes long, so it's physically incapable of being bad enough to kill off my brain cells, or at least until someone tells me about the permanent side effects of induced narcolepsy. Operation Sanctuary is about a virus a hundred years in the future, but it almost feels ashamed of being a time travel anime because this only gets squirted out nine episodes in as if it's contractually obligated to have have the big reveal at the mathematically theoretical point of maximum boredom. Or it would if it had a mystery to reveal. Instead of saying, hey, these characters are weird before running away and hiding behind anime bullshit, giggling the entire time like a schoolgirl with a crate of spent whippets. Uh, bad. Maroko. Imagine sitting through a two hour play from an art student whose qualifications are they did mushrooms once and won't shut the fuck up about their experience because they think it's some life changing revelation when all it sounds like to any sensible person Person, is that they gave themselves brain damage and now physically lack the self-awareness to notice. Now imagine that this place somehow got turned into an anime and you have Maruko right down to this shitty acoustic guitar and embarrassingly banal poetry. Oh, a yellow flower, look at you. Maybe I should start taking hallucinogenics too. Now, I'm not saying that no one should take mushrooms ever, but what I am saying is maybe the fact that you all know exactly the kind of person I'm talking about means they shouldn't write fucking plays. Basically, Maruko is a very pretentious anime meant to look like a very terrible play where all the characters argue with the logic of a girl who claims to be from the future, but not only do none of them make any sense, no character talks even remotely like a real person or has any clear motivations, so the entire thing just goes in circles for the entire two hour exposition dump that is this movie's runtime. It's a piece of bullshit that holds up the pretentious label of art to hide the fact that it's a shallow, boring story that goes nowhere and has nothing to say. It's the embodiment of everything wrong with the art world, and if you liked it, you're an idiot and I hate you. Body complex. Imagine literal friendship powered mecha suits and you have buddy complex. And by friendship, I mean gay, as two dudes gain mecha superpowers by coupling and proposing and docking and but fucking. Yeah, I know that sounds awesome, but all this anime really does is throw made up words at the screen and then lay back and light a cigarette going, how was that, baby? Well, it was shit. Obviously, I'm gonna go finish myself off in the bathroom, then go home. Basically, mech pilots gain superpowers by coupling with another pilot, but the main problem with this anime is that it just expects you to be on board with all of its wank without ever giving you a reason to. I mean, the dude just docks with the guy and then suddenly gains all of his skill and becomes the world's greatest pilot without even trying. Challenge? 
conflict? What are these made up words? I mean, made up words by other more competent people. But all of this would be fine if the underlying story was good and... Uh, let's put it this way. The explanation for the buddy system is time travel. I'm serious, the dude explaining it just says it's time travel and then walks away and then dies like immediately. And then in the sequel OVA, it just says the same thing again. It's like, yeah, it works by sending elementary particles of thought data into the future to the other person. So instead we invented a new system that just sends them back to the pilot so you don't need a partner. I, I don't know if I can even begin to describe how much that isn't an explanation. For one, how does connecting to another person give them superpowers? How is this a connection and not just like an advanced radio? And I guess there's the obvious question of, if you could use it on yourself, why would this not be the first step? How would that even, you know what? I don't, you know what, I don't give a shit. Don't watch this. It doesn't even tell you why anyone's fighting. It's just mecha anime, but gay. And then mecha anime, but gayer when it inevitably becomes straight. I don't know, fuck this show. So last time it was mechs, but gay. And now it's mechs with creepy fuck dolls. Yes, I too am shunk by the astounding creativity that can only come from the mecha genre. But I guess this is what makes Japan such an amazing country. Oh, sorry, did I say fuck dolls? I meant it literally does not tell us what powers it. See, they're all powered by some stem cell abomination called Mimics, but the only one it actually shows us is instead a fake Mimic from a race of lolly aliens that are literally only used as a plot device for the bad guy going insane. Uh, what? Were you interested in how the mechs work? Yeah, no, you're right. That's just gimmicky dressing on the plot and the characters, except, oh god, those don't exist either. The moment Mersoko no Strain absolutely lost me is when it spent more than one episode on a girl throwing away the main character's secret military weapon because she wanted wanted to get in her pants. It's like these anime only get funded if there's a certain amount of inane bullshit just rammed into the middle. Yes, instead of spending your limited runtime on real character development so the characters freaking out about revenge and morality actually make an inkling of sense, you have a bunch of adult soldiers throw a high school party. It's like, not only do they not have the capacity to imagine what real people sound like, they don't even have the capacity to imagine what fictional people would spend their time doing. A high school party! This is the best you could come up with. Embarrassing. Yet this is somehow more coherent than the actual plot. Basically, super cliched bit about girls searching for her brother who turned evil, and at the end, plot twist actually turns out to be good, except only instead of using this to explore deeper themes, say, random example, the morality of using the psychic powers of a race of enslaved space lollies to further the development of humanity as it reaches out across the stars, it just does a big rug pull and goes, psych, he's crazy, so he actually was just bad the entire time. Do you people really have no further ambitions, no desire to write something with actual meaning or emotion, something that furthers our understanding of humanity and our place in the world, of what it truly means to live, to be human, of the paradox of being conscious to the utter insignificance of our existence on some tiny floating rock lost in the cold, infinite expanse of the universe. No, none at all. No, just teddies. Well, okay, fuck you too, asshole. Shonen Kenya. Out of all the bad anime I watched to make this list, I was by far the most disappointed by Kenya Boy. Not because I thought it'd be actually good, but because this is supposed to be one of the most legendarily bad anime of all time, and I was looking forward to tearing it to pieces. What, this? It's bad, sure, but the worst I can really say about it is that it's just boring and generic, if slightly fetishistic, of somehow both Africa and Japan, at least until they run away from lizard people living in an underwater cave and an atomic bomb goes off disrupting time and space and a T-Rex fights a giant snake. Okay, sure, it's a bit stupid, but I've seen so, so, so many way shittier anime to make this list. At least this one has some creativity put into it, with this eclectic mix of animation styles drawing a difference between the wild and the familiar and the familial. That's at least more than you could say about DNA 2, which wouldn't know creativity if it punched it in the deck. Fuck you, weebs. Not sure why this is rated so low, I said. Seems like a pretty normal fairy tale, I said. Wait, why is this body snatching tongue demon doing a thinly veiled hentai scene before copying the girl and barfing up a lizard that jumps off the snatch of another naked girl, I said. Oh, I said. 
I get it now, I said. Uh, it probably won't surprise you to hear that this was written by the dude who basically invented Echi. So, the best way I can describe Stendoji is just a long series of Deus Ex Machinas stitched together with extremely gory action scenes, titties, and a lot of screaming that sounds like the actors were trying really hard not to laugh while they were doing this, and saying it makes zero sense would be like saying me rabidly clicking through hentai clips while jerking off doesn't sound like a movie. Look, if you need a recap before the last episode of your four episode direct to VHS OVA, you need to stop because you've already fucked up. Basically, parents adopted a demon, and now that he's 16, he's the super oni who all the demons are trying to kill. Then, and I swear I'm being as descriptive as I can, stuff happens before he teleports in front of a spaceship a hundred years in the future, hunted by a dude who literally became an immortal cyborg to take revenge on him, and then gets sent back in time by the secret time machine that's just kind of lying around before the entire thing collapses in an extremely masturbatory ending that is so ridiculously convoluted and nonsensical that it's almost smart, but because the parents are just sitting in a fucking room the entire time, it actually makes even less sense than if they just gave up halfway through. I'm gonna be honest, I was tempted to throw this with Alice into the dumpster tier because it's just such a unique brand of failure that I feel it deserves a special mention, but unlike ass ligma sex, at almost three and a half hours, this is far too long to be even ironically entertaining. After hearing this first sentence, you might be confused as to how Bakumatsu is so boring because it's about a ninja that goes back in time to make the samurais gay. I'm serious, that's what happens. Basically, two samurai try to steal this magical time travel artifact when it gets reverse stolen by a ninja for someone who goes back in time to train martial arts like really hard and also bring back random shoguns like his personal army of Power Rangers. I have so many questions. One, what? Two, what the fuck? Those are like the two single least productive uses of time travel you could come up with. Sure, they get some technology and shit, but 99% of their effort was building this ridiculous super fortress and also making everyone dress really gay. Now, if this sounds like the setup for the most legendarily campy anime of all time, I would agree with you, but believe it or not, this anime wouldn't because Bakumatsu actually takes itself 100% serious. Like, okay, example. The Townsfolk in Gay Edo are being suppressed by these guard dolls with tuning forks that bang to signal the cannons to fire any time they hear dissent. And so when they infiltrate the castle, one of them cuts open this door and finds the control room that's just a bunch of huge tuning forks. That's fucking hilarious! And the anime is all like, ooh, yeah, no, this is like super cool and steampunk. And like, you know how I keep making videos about how anime writers don't understand the stories they're making? This is exactly what I'm talking about. Any sane person would take one look at this and fucking piss themselves. But this anime just doesn't do that. Even though this is how it ends. Yeah, dude just jumps across an airship before they battle to the death and blow it up. And at no point does the anime seem to stop or even consider giving you the slightest hint of a wink or a nudge. Just sad. Okay, I need to make something clear. I love camp. In fact, I'm on record as saying that the best shonen action of all time is James Bond Moonraker. And while Occult Academy has the soul of camp, it's maybe more akin to setting your neighbor's lawn on fire and calling it a cookout. Or maybe the problem is that camp's so hard it blacks out and wakes up face down in the fire pit because it completely forgets that it's not supposed to be taken seriously like three episodes in, as if it didn't start with a naked time traveler using a cell phone camera to find a magic key to save the world from the occult at a school run by a lunatic who accidentally killed himself trying to tape record a magic curse, and end with him bending a spoon so hard all the aliens die. This is another one of those moments where if I were editing this script, I'd just circle this part about 10 times with a sharpie and then just kind of stare at the writers like they're illiterate. Your camp just Run with it. This is like trying to unshit halfway through a dump. You can try, but all you'll end up with is a slightly dirtier asshole. Only, it's also just so 
bad at being serious. I can point to the exact point the anime completely lost me, and it's the episode about the ghost of a little girl who froze to death because it ends with UFO music and it's like, whoa, spooky, it's a ghost. Sure, it eventually remembers that it's supposed to be camp and starts pulling plot devices out of its asshole like it's sat on a library, but by that time it's too late because I've already stopped caring. It could have been good, but in my book, any show that spends more than half its runtime trying to be anything other than itself is a colossal failure. Charlotte. Tell me this doesn't sound interesting. Raging Psychopath has the power to control others for five seconds at a time and uses it to manipulate everyone around him when he's picked up by Xavier's school for the comically useless superpowers to turn his life around. Now imagine the writers went nope and randomly decided in the second episode that he's actually the most predictable, milk toast, boring protagonist this side of SAO, but then randomly has such a hardcore mental breakdown that he almost <gasps> tries to smoke weed. I'd call this stale and inconsistent at best and borderline schizophrenic at worst, and maybe Charlotte would have been interesting if it stuck with the ironic X-Men thing because it starts off being admittedly really funny but very quickly runs into two insurmountable problems. One is that, and it's gonna sound like I'm exaggerating here, but trust me I'm not, a good 30% of every episode is just some long screaming. Seriously, every girl in the show is a lolly and I had to check to make sure they weren't all played by the same fucking actor because it's basically the exact same thing repeated every 10 seconds as it was meticulously focus tested to be jerked off to by a Ubisoft committee. The other is that it just keeps trying to be serious but this doesn't work when the tone spins in circles faster than a puppy on cocaine. There's an episode where Protag Kun locks himself inside and it's supposed to be all sad and depressed and edgy when it randomly pulls down its pants and ejaculates a lolly shit into the middle and then looks around quizzically as if it didn't just unload all over the carpet. Charlotte has a lot of good ideas, but they're all just haphazardly slammed in there like the drunk tank at 4 a.m. on Halloween, the worst offender being the time travel thing, which has dude going back in time and erasing everyone's memories. And it's like, why would you need to erase everyone's memories? And he just says, oh, you know reasons. Bitch, what? Not that that ever matters because Charlotte, like everything else the story had built up until this moment, drops it almost immediately before sprinting to the ending and collapsing in a masturbatory haze. Dull, confusing, and worst of all, populated by way too many goddamn lollies. Here's the problem with trying really hard to be funny. If you're not, you just draw attention to your worst traits and come across as uncompetent, which is why I make sure to really draw it and torture every single one of my dick jokes as a way to assert my sigma male dominance over my audience. I bring this up because we write it as the classic evil mega corporation plot, complete with a giant tower like something straight out of the Proto Man, which generally works because the corporation is faceless and there's nothing more menacing than the almighty unknown. So what we write it does is instead give a face to this mega corporation and make him the most pathetic beta male ever and suddenly the entire story is harder to take seriously than a hamster in a speedo. If I didn't know better, I'd say the writers were trying to make this anime bad because it undermines literally almost everything it does. There's this one part where an android is supposed to copy a researcher's personality and as it starts appearing more and more like her, she starts questioning which one is really the human and eventually murders the robot and takes its name, which would be genuinely unnerving if it didn't show us this exact scene five minutes later, only with the robot clearly having a robot's voice, appearance, and mannerisms, which completely undermines this for absolutely no reason and says the scientist was just independently crazy. Every part of this story is just tainted with stupid. The main character accidentally lies down in a cryosleep pod because reasons. Every character just keeps randomly name dropping random other characters and waving their hands and going pcha like Freddie Mercury showed up to play the encore for their terrible high school band. The time travel rules almost seem made up as the show goes on. And to top it off, there's this bit where they just insert the author's made up English pseudoname halfway into every episode like it's a fucking K-pop band or something. Clock. Clock, 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 clock,
Natasha. Would you be surprised if I told you the director also directed Steins Gate? I was until I realized he also directed Urasekai Picnic. That's right, never give up on your dreams, weebs, because even the biggest idiots can do great things when the stars align. If that's not the greatest piece of motivational advice you've ever heard, then find an ENT because you're probably deaf. Sometimes I see an anime and I just know the director was jerking off to it. How do I know? Well, I could lie and tell you it's a hunch, or I could point to the USB cord suspiciously hanging out of the ass of the busty 10 inch tall maid girl and just kind of stare at you while wiggling my finger and going <laughs> I don't know if the fact that the main character shoved it up there is more or less of an implication of some kind of sex toy, but when they start calling her Chibi Robo, the cute robot game suddenly seems a lot less innocent as you realize they probably came up with it after fapping to this anime. But weird fetishes aside, the 10 inch tall maid is a really fun dynamic with a lot of visual storytelling potential that would have carried this whole anime if it were not brought out behind the shed and shot halfway through. Now, I really like how silly and self-aware it all is, but the other problem with Handmaid May is that it never takes the time to actually establish any of the characters' motivations. When Kazuya gets a delivery of a mini robot maid out of nowhere, and then the evil wife who is self-proclaimed rival start trying to repossess her, it's never clear why he was given the maid in the first place or why anything is happening. And that's mostly fine when the conflict revolves around him and May trying to avoid whatever weird kink this is supposed to be. But then that just gets resolved and May turns normal size after the fourth episode and suddenly no character has any real motivations. And without even the visual gag of the tiny maid girl, the entire thing becomes even more pointless than a goldfish at the marble factory. Eventually, like an alarming number of these anime, the show breathes a heavy sigh and throws out the actual plot and the time travel stuff after nine episodes like it's the red-headed stepchild, only let out to eat once the anime tropes have all had a chance to come on the table. Weebs, do you know how much goddamn shit I had to sit through to make this video? Yes, you do. I literally made a list. That was the entire point. But that was all worth it because I finally got to sit down with a classic mecha anime that starts with the characters blowing up a space elevator with a space-time bomb. This bitch is what I wanted to see. Space battles and technology and political intrigue and oh dear god, it's a really bad edgy slice of life wearing a Gundam t-shirt. God damn you! Damn you all to hell! <laughs> oh I don't know what bothers me more, the part where all the girls frequently rub tentacles to show affection, or the part where the hover bikes raise their butts in the air like it's a flying tundra chair. Or maybe it's that the tentacle girls physically stop being a woman the moment they turn 18. Or that the only other male character aboard the ship, the protagonist cucks so hard he literally dies. Or maybe it's the big titty lolly. Or maybe it's that the plot structure is an almost insultingly blatant ripoff of Gundam, but without all the nuance and intelligence Gundam had. Or perhaps this is all just my fault for being naively optimistic when the series opened with a sex scene, expecting something like a Captain Kirk or Han Solo type character instead of, you know, anime. The protagonist is as cliched as he is stupid, but the plot just chugs along anyway. There's a moment in like the second episode where he sneaks into the base and pulls a knife on this chick and when she threatens to scream, he kisses her to keep her silent. See, this would make sense if they didn't already know him. He was allowed to go into the base. What the fuck? Why would any part of this happen? Oh my god. Now, there are cool fights, but they all feel just so obligatory and rammed in there so they can have a mech battle on TV every week. And as a result, the plot just goes in circles and the story just drags on and on. Congratulations, you somehow made mecha battles boring when you stretched eight episodes worth of plot over 35. But maybe the single most infuriating thing about this show is that literally the entire plot is just him trying to reach the space elevator where the dimension bomb blew up so they can restore space time. The entire story builds up to this one moment, and then when he gets there, I shit you not, it just fucking ends with no explanation like the writers all seppuku when they realize what they'd written. This came out almost exactly 40 years ago, but feels disappointingly modern. Oh, anime is garbage? Always has been. Generator Gauru. See how fast you can spot the problem with this premise. What? They sent superhumans to the past? Dear 
God, did you say superhumans to the time machine? And then they just kind of get in a time machine like they're heading for the happy ending massage parlor. Like, no, 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 no stop. You can't just gloss over this. You, you can't do that. It's not how this works. The problem with time travel stories is you can't have anything more powerful than time travel because that doesn't exist. And a show that spends its last half dumping so much exposition on you that you come away physically wet, you'd think Generator Gall would at least try to justify the time travel. But it never does. Instead, they just have Lily Pechu show up with her piano con and start pissing all over the place. I mean, Kamen Rider was great and all, but a goddamn time machine is a little more dangerous than a spandex suit, yes? No, dear God. The thing is, this anime isn't actually terrible compared to all the other anime on this list. It's got an eye for cinematography, the fight scenes are actually great, and the characters, hmm, this is, this is always the sticking point, isn't it? But the utter confidence with which it just completely ignores all of the time travel it uses to tell its story is utterly baffling. Here's an idea. Did this really need to be a time travel story? Like, really, if you cared that little about the time travel element, why is it in there in the first place? The story wouldn't change in any significant way if time travel was literally just removed. Then it would be merely generic and inoffensive rather than generic, inoffensive, and extremely fucking stupid. <sighs> Here's the part in the video where I have to deflect all the rabid ReZero fans that swarm like ants to any video that so much gives a passing mention to their favorite waifu engine. If me putting it in D tier offends you though, here's what I want you to do. Stop watching this and go watch this, which is the smartest critical analysis of ReZero ever written because there's no way I can explain this in a rapid fire critique, okay? Cool. Okay, are they gone yet? Cool. Okay, cool. Jesus, you know, if I were a smart man, I'd start only writing ReZero essays and just rake in the views, if only I was willing to put up with the low, low cost of my integrity. Obviously, I wouldn't have pointed to a 40 minute video if I thought I could convince any of them here, but the TLDR is that everything horribly wrong with ReZero actually makes it kind of intelligent in a roundabout kind of way, but clever doesn't mean good because it commits the single greatest cardinal sin in storytelling, and I'd honestly rather kill myself than sit through ReZero again. Before shitting all over this anime, I need you to know something. You know is easily the single most important story on this list. Literally, and I do mean literally, almost none of these anime would exist without it. It never really took off in the West, probably because of the whole Winzest thing, but you know was one of, if not the single most influential narrative video game in Japan, and basically single-handedly redefined how people thought about interactive stories. Being the direct inspiration for Steins Gate, along with many, many other anime, I seriously cannot understate just how important this story is to the history of not just games, but anime and Japanese fiction as a whole. So then, how does the anime adaptation live up to such a legacy? Or I guess since you've probably noticed there's several minutes left in D tier even though this is the last review. All right, weeb, tell us how they fucked it up. Well, I'll explain the plot in a second, but first, I guess the main thing wrong with this is that the writers decided they really wanted it to be anything but, you know, most obviously when the main character, Takuya, four episodes in, has to timely to save one of the characters dying from world line convergence. Look, I know Steins Gate is kind of the best and all, and that's kind of the whole point of this list, but you people need to stop taking all these different stories and trying to pretend that there's Steins Gate. You don't need to do that. This one came first. It was literally the main inspiration for Steins Gate. It's a great story in its own right. Why the fuck would you want to make it Steins Gate? Hello? Her death isn't convergence, she kills herself as the natural consequence of a sequence of events she has the power to change, and then does. Why is she even killing herself in different ways every time? Why would she do that? The only way this would make sense to you is if you watched Steins Gate and thought, yes, I don't understand this. And that's not even getting into the suicide itself. So, you know, is about this boy, Tom when he realizes his missing father isn't actually dead, but instead has disappeared after discovering the secret to time travel. Ayumi, Takeya's new stepmom, despite having just lost her husband, tries to do her 
her best to be a working single mother to this boy who she feels like she barely knows because she's the only family he has left. And when she starts taking the public outrage for all the bad things her company is doing, she ends up doing bad things herself to try and make it better. And when her adopted son sees this, she starts feeling like she's ruined not only her own life, but her son's as well. And when Takia tries to help her, she tells him to let the grown-ups handle this before locking herself in the bathroom and killing herself. Now, let's go over how the anime ruins almost every single part of this. First, when she goes on TV and the reporter, Kaori, tears her a new one. In the anime, Kaori just doesn't do this. Not only does this kind of ruin Cowdy's character, who's supposed to be this ruthless, fiercely intelligent journalist who stops at nothing to get her way, this questions why Ayumi still comes home drunk, and for some reason drunk Ayumi is a baby, which is just weird. And then instead of letting herself be blackmailed into having sex with this dude, Ayumi just wants him? See, suicide only works if the character's troubles are believable, but this anime strips her of all nuance and she just comes across as irrational. I know trying to re write a non-linear 40-hour game into 26 episodes is hard, but none of this has anything to do with the pacing of the story, especially since they added a scene where Takuya dreams she kills herself at the beginning of the episode, so you see it coming from a mile away. What? what? Why would you do that? It feels like every single character has just had the edges of their personality sanded right off. And you can really see this in the character designs, which are all completely lacking the character of the original. They're more technically competent, sure, but at the same time, they're so much more generic. Like, why is Mio wearing a school uniform? What happened to her blue dress? Maybe underage girls are hotter if they look the part too. I guess good job in making the story creepier with less pornography. What an accomplishment. But I mean, just look at these designs. Now look at the originals. They have so much more character. Look at Cowdy. Wonder where they got her hair from. Cough, cough, barf, barf. The only character that looks better is Yuki, who they've halfway redesigned, and you'd think that's because they realize he's the worst character in the story. But this leads me to the other problem with the anime, and that's that they gave the annoying childish dude more lines because it's afraid to shut the fuck up for five seconds. See, we can't just talk about Yuno as a narrative because one of the biggest reasons it's still remembered today. It's, it's a legendary soundtrack by composer Ryu Umimoto. Now, you may or may not have heard of him, but this dude is literally more well known in the West than all of the games he's ever worked on. How many games do you know have hundreds of thousands of people who have never once seen them, let alone jerked off to them, listening to their music? I'm probably the only non-Japanese person who's fapped to all of them. Seriously, that's the beautiful thing about music. It transcends the barriers of language and even masturbation. Umimoto's soundtrack is this gorgeous, hauntingly melancholy experience. It makes the game not just this fun time travel adventure, not just some premium sauce, but seriously unforgettable. Let's compare this scene from the visual novel of this mysterious woman appearing to Taki over the underground lake. Do you see the difference? That's not to say they use none of Umemoto's soundtrack because they did use some, mostly the main motif, which is fucking awesome, but they really could have used more of it. Arguably, this is a strength of visual novels that's a lot harder to pull off in an anime, but while the anime just drags in Yuki whenever it feels the need to fill silence with something, the visual novel is just not afraid to shut the fuck up and let Umimoto's sick beats carry me all the way to Synth Town. And it's honestly weird just how thoroughly they refuse to let the story be, you know. Like, get this, there's a swimsuit episode just rammed into the middle of this thing. Is, is that not weird? It's weird that they added a swimsuit episode to an Eroge adaptation, right? That the anime cuts so much of the important bits and replaces it with the two least important characters going to the beach? Am I missing something? Or is the average Japanese weeb really so boring that they actually want to watch a bunch of Eroge characters hang out at the beach? Again, you do have 
have to make some concessions in writing to translate a non-linear eroge to a 26 episode anime, but they didn't just do this with the main part, they did it with the linear second half of the story too. Why? Instead of just following the now linear story, they again wrote in so many lines for the most irrelevant characters and then added in some random lolly for good measure. And then I really don't want to spoil the ending, but for some reason they thought it'd be a good idea to turn the climax into the most generic end of the world action scene ever and it's just awful. Seriously, if you paid me money to come up with something more generic, I literally don't think I could. I won't call this Netflix level bastardization because what this feels like is that they're trying to do the source material justice and they're just like wildly incompetent. But almost every part of this is just embarrassing to watch. I tried to come up with good things to say about it, but literally every single thing they changed just came out as yet another incompetent failure. I mean, they took out the horrible win incest, partially, yay, but then they also went and took out all of the age scenes with it, boo. But then, for some reason, they still had the two characters hugging naked, so make of that what you will. And they did tried to fix the one major flaw in the original, which is that the two halves of the story almost feel like two completely separate stories haphazardly rammed together like a drunken buttfuck. But in fixing it, they threw in all this random shit, and most of it just does not make sense, so now it's not only needlessly convoluted, but also extremely stupid. Wow. That is some pretty damning criticism, King of Weeaboos. Why did this not go all the way down in F tier? Here's the thing, if I can be completely honest for a second, the core of the story and the characters are still there, mostly, so it's not like this is a complete train wreck, it's just that having played the original, it is like aggressively disappointing. If this were its own thing, and not one of the most influential stories in the history of anime, I might have even bumped it up to C tier, but it's not, and it was, so you know gets to go in D tier with a bucket of shame. C tier. C tier is the funnest one to write about because they're generally interesting but heavily flawed like a unicorn with three dicks. Fascinating, but why does it have three dicks? Alternatively, they're actually so unremarkable that I had to come up with something interesting to say about it all on my own, like I spray painted a horse and super glued a couple dicks to it. Natsuno Arashi. Natsuno Arashi feels like an anime that would have been good. As in, if it were an anime, not the disembodied heads of eight different anime, because the only thing you're gonna make out of eight disembodied embodied heads is a very tortured fuck doll. Interwoven in this disjointed slice of life comedy plot about a cafe in the summer, among a million other things, is this whole bit about going back in time to the firebombing of Tokyo, and it's really tasteful and nuanced, but tasteful and nuanced doesn't really describe anything else in the anime because every episode feels like it was written by a different person. Like the head writer sat down and asked everyone what kind of story they wanted to make and they all just put up their hands and said yes. Speaking as a writer myself, something you need to learn is restraint. Just because something is good independently doesn't mean you human centipede it into whatever you're making. There's this character that just sits in the cafe and asks for salt again and again every episode and no one pays attention to him and it feels like it's supposed to be building up to something big bigger and deeper, but like literally every single other idea this anime raises is just cast aside and forgotten like a used tissue, with the only difference being that nothing in this anime ever finishes. Sure, I bet this delightfully confusing story about creating time loops and paradoxes just to eat the last slice of cake would be a good anime. I bet this story about ghosts clinging to the past and the horrors of war would be a good anime. I bet this Freaky Friday thing where one of them doesn't know the other is actually a girl would be a good anime. I bet this slice of life story about a cafe that exists in every era would be a good anime. I bet this story about a time traveling girl whose fate is connected to generations of people and their descendants would be a good anime. I bet these characters that keep erupting into weirdly ironic plays about the most violently mundane things would be a good anime. I bet each of these things would be a good anime. The really infuriating part is that it has the space to tie up at least some of these things at the end and just doesn't because the story ends at episode 12 and then has a full bonus episode of the characters just screwing around. I mean, it doesn't just forget everything it starts, it literally forgets that it fucking ends. It's like a narcoleptic goldfish. The only thing tying every episode together is the characters, but none of them make any sense either. The main character is a 13 year old and he acts 13, but the rest of the characters are, or at least act like adults, and it's not clear why anyone would even give him the time of day, so he's just a annoying in context. Thing is, very little in this anime is technically 
bad in any way. Independently, it's mostly very competent, but at the end, I couldn't help wondering what the fucking point of it all was because nothing actually fits together. I mean, the main OP is this chill summer beat set to softcore pornography, and every episode finishes with these two girls having these ironic pseudo-intellectual literary discussions about random children's manga. There's like eight different anime in here, but I'm not sure any of them are Natsuno Arashi. But whatever this is goes in the bottom of a C tier because it is by far the most confused anime I've ever seen. Divisions. Revisions is what happens when writers confuse having an unlikable protagonist with one that is just really, really annoying. I can just imagine the writer's room. Oh, we're so tired of the anime protagonist. So vapid and lethargic. Let's write someone unlikable and stick out our raging hard cocks to catch all the edgy art awards as they come raining in. Well, they failed because the only way I can describe Daisuke is a huge fucking cock. He and his four friends met this time traveling waifu from the future who told him that he was destined to save everyone. So naturally he orients his entire personality around being the destined hero and apparently his only frame of reference for hero is the slightly racist part of Tech Talk because he becomes the world's most abrasive person and spends basically 100% of his time lifting. What it's missing is that a character like Bojack Horseman is still interesting. Sure, he's an asshole, but he's funny and endearing in a screaming car crash kind of way. Whereas Daisuke throws a tantrum and knocks over his own birthday cake when the other characters finally realize that Weeaboo Tate over here is violently unqualified to be the leader. Like, what part of being a hero means you only care about this one thing? I'd say it's a miracle that any of them are still friends with him, but that assumes that any of the other characters act like rational people. When Shibuya gets time warped into the future and they have to fight in mecha suits, the police chief makes him the leader because he had 30 minutes of mecha suit experience. Ah. Yes, obviously being violently impulsive is a sign he can make rational decisions affecting the lives of thousands of people. Good thing we have Captain Sensible over here in charge of the police as they go around arresting everyone but the adult woman wearing futuristic body armor. But my biggest problem with revisions is that for an anime that so deliberately tosses aside protag kun conventions, it has even less ambition than your mom when she first discovered pot. Midway through the story, they realize that the huge robot monster things they're fighting are actually humans, which is an interesting bit of moral complexity that it goes absolutely nowhere with, giving zero explanation of how exactly they managed to become giant killer robots, why they decided to become monsters, what the revisions are, what the revisions who aren't monsters are supposed to be, or what any of their real motivations are. I guess this might be explained in the eventual season too, but it just took this perfect opportunity to be meaningful and threw up its hands going, wow, bad guys, even throwing in an overly saccharine ending that tells us that dead guy isn't dead and bad guy isn't dead either, so literally none of this meant anything. Don't you hate when you're watching a story and has to ruin your enjoyment by having things happen? Yeah, me too. Oh, and why are the kids pilots? Because of Gundam, probably. Okay, so the reason Gundam used a kid is because it's a horrible coincidence. Amaro should not have been the Gundam pilot. You can't just throw kids in mechs and be like, yeah, obviously that's what you do. It's not. That was literally the entire point. Don't get me wrong. Wrong. Revisions is fine, that's why it's in C tier, I'll be barely. The writing and the pacing work, none of the scenes completely bored me. 3D anime suits Mecha the best, and while the gray and brown apocalypse is maybe not the most interesting setting, it'd be hard to say the action scenes don't at least look cool. If the idea of mecha anime that you can turn your brain off to watch sounds appealing to you, you're obviously going to like it, but I prefer anime that at least gives you the option of turning your brain on, and instead Revision sticks its thumb up its nose and goes this won't surprise anyone who hasn't been living under a rock for the last 10 years, but Future Diary is like legendarily bad. The main problem with it is that Yukiteto is literally the single worst protagonist in the history of anime. I'm serious, take any anime from D or F tier, well maybe not Mirai no Mirai, that one doesn't count, but literally any other one. Yuki Teru is a way shittier protagonist. Not only is he the most annoying and pathetic sack of shit possible, he does not have agency. Now, I don't mean he hesitates to make his own decisions, I mean there is literally, literally, not a single moment in the story where he makes his own decisions. Zero. It doesn't even happen once. All he does is sit in the corner and cry until someone comes along to pull up his pants and give him a juice box. What the damn hell? He's the protagonist. How could you possibly fuck up this bad? Now, here's the part where you're probably wondering, wait, 
how on earth did this make it all the way up in C tier? And to be honest, Yukiteru is such an offensively bad character that it maybe shouldn't. But if you manage to get past that, and for most of you, I really don't blame you if you don't, the rest is pretty compelling. Well, rest is maybe a bit generous. Now that I say it out loud, so too is the word compelling. But let's say it's at least insane enough to catch your attention from across a crowded room, if only out of survival instinct. Basically, every character has a diary that predicts the future to help them in this extreme battle royale to the death where the winner gets to become God. Imagine Death Note, but with 12 people and also the writers were high. I'd say the main thing that saves this from being a lame doujin precursor to cast into the fires of Mount Doom is the unironically excellent mystery left carrying this show forwards, or at least with only a slight limb, but I also can't ignore my personal bias here because this is the show that sold me on anime. This did? Yeah, I know, sad. In my pre-Weeaboo days, I fumbled around the depths of the internet in a Death Note-fueled haze and eventually stumbled upon Future Diary and the extreme kink of Yandere waifus, and ten years later, I'm yelling about it in a room by myself and placing it into C tier as a feeble attempt to justify my fondness for this show as something other than what most people would call an excessive amount of masturbation. In short, Future Diary is bad, but unlike all the other trash anime on this list, it at least has the balls to show you Yuno's tits. And I think that's worth something. The first question I had while watching Time Stranger is, why is the car the mystery machine? Seriously, when was this made? The 80s? What on earth went wrong for this to be your time machine car? What, were you like, shit, we can't do a car? Back to the Future already did that. I know, we should do Scooby-Doo. The people, they love Scooby-Doo. In Japan, Japan doesn't even know Scooby-Doo. It's perfect. So this was my setup for what I'd convinced myself after several cans of Strong Zero is a really clever joke until I stopped to look up when it came out and realized that this is probably literally exactly what happened and discovered that the real joke is that the King of Weeaboos is apparently physically incapable of ever being wrong. The real problem here though is that Time Stranger is a movie with clearly way more thought put into its market appeal than the actual plot. See, future dude escapes dystopian future to avoid brainwashing by stealing a time machine that can only travel to the past because obviously they make sense, shut up. But the problem is that the reason he got brainwashed is almost impressively stupid. He asked what the period of famine and hardship is and then got enlisted for brainwashing. Asking about the past? Ghoul egg! Didn't want to see it, didn't question it, literally just asked what it's like. Oh yeah, wouldn't want anyone to know the old era ended with a nuclear war, they might irrationally cling to the current regime like a bunch of illiterate sheep. Wouldn't want that, would we? Jesus. No, apparently not, because if they knew about it, they might try to change the past in the 16th century to avoid nuclear war in 2080, because that makes lots of sense. Shut up! God damn, fun movie. Alarmingly dumb. Here's how you know something goes immediately into C tier. If, by the end, I'd written down basically nothing about the story or the characters because the entire thing had passed in and out of my head like an eel through a lubed up hallway. To put it another way, fireworks is what you'd probably refer to as thoroughly and utterly mid if mid wasn't a stance taken by cowards who are too afraid to say anything of substance lest someone point out the obvious that they have absolutely no idea what they are talking about. Better to shut the fuck up and be thought an idiot than to call something mid mid and remove all doubt, as the saying goes. The main problem with fireworks is that it's supposed to be a love story, but neither character has a reason for being interested in the other. The girl just arbitrarily confesses to one of two dude bros, and because of time travel we see her talk to both of them exactly the same, aloof and dismissive like a horny cat. If it's a love story and we don't know why the characters like each other, why are we watching in the first place? Why did you like him? He had a dick, I guess. Why did he like her? Oh god, that's even less clear. The opening of the movie spent an alarming amount of time focusing on all the girls' tits like they dispense Mountain Dew and Sunshine, and the girl is the one female in the story that doesn't have a huge rack, and yet they both like her. I'd call this writing inconsistent if it wasn't also so lifeless and uninspired. And I'd tell it to maybe focus on the homies a little more if it didn't spend the entire other half of the movie on them debating whether or not fireworks are flat or round. Interesting in a mundane slice of life kind of way, but this just goes on and on. It's almost hard to tell where any part of this movie begins and ends because it can't even muster up enough energy to fart out a real ending. It just kind of stops and unenthusiastically goes Ta-da! Like its mom is the only person who came to see it, and I had to check my pulse to make sure I hadn't died without noticing halfway through. Technically, this is far better than everything in D tier, but it's just so violently unremarkable in every single way that I can't 
possibly recommend this first because they're at least interesting to talk about. Tokyo Revengers. If you listen to Trash Taste, you might have heard Connor say this. I was kind of pissed off as well that like all of these kids are like 13, 14. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was like, why not? Why? Just make them 17. Before actually watching Tokyo Revengers, I just kind of dismissed this as the classic anime bullshit that we all have to look past. But maybe Connor just isn't articulate enough to express what's wrong here, because I think the problem he's trying to get at isn't that it's set in middle school, it's that the show can barely go five minutes without reminding you that they're in middle school. <laughs> その辺の中学生より低かった。中坊どもがよ。中坊連合によ。Oh, uh, yeah, when you put it like that, I guess it is really fucking stupid. I have no idea why you'd want to keep reminding us how poorly written your story is, though. This is the kind of thing that would be played as a joke in something like Psyche K, or ironically in something like Mob Psycho 100, but here it just takes it completely seriously. It feels like something an actual middle schooler would have written, and not in a good way. If you're 14 and watching this, well, first, dear God, stop. But also, I hate to be the one to break this to you, but you're not cool, you're 14. But on top of reminding you several times an episode, that the anime is really stupid, the characters are just bad. <laughs> Okay, so there's making every single character a cliched stereotype, and then there's this. Here's a tip for all you aspiring anime writers out there. If you can sum up your character in two words, it isn't very good. But this isn't just tired, lazy writing. It reeks of unconfident. There isn't even a need to ram this in here because literally none of this is relevant to what's happening. We can just learn about them as we go, like, you know, normal fucking people. What, are you afraid someone's gonna get lost if they don't know this dude's personality is that he jerks? off a lot, actually embarrassing. Now, you might be like, wait a minute, so-called king of weeaboos, stop nitpicking, it's not supposed to be deep, you obviously just don't like shonen action, and no, I generally don't, but there's a pretty big leap between swallowing some flaws and straight up bukkake. In, say, Pokemon, does Oak tell Ash, oh, Pikachu will shock you every time he gets a stiffy. Or does Pikachu just come out and shock them? It isn't about being simple and easy to understand. This is easy to understand. This is easy to write. There's a difference. To be clear, I'm not saying Pokemon is some masterclass in animation. I'm not, and it isn't. I'm saying its writing is slightly better than embarrassingly bad. The weird part is that Tokyo Revengers almost tries to be so tonally inconsistent the whiplash might actually break your neck. There's a bit where Takemichi stops his friends from fighting because he has dog shit on his head, and they all go, ah, ew, you have poo on your head, and then run away giggling like a bunch of 14-year-olds, which they are, but then it goes right back to the gang violence with the motorcycles and the stabbing. Obviously, it needs to have lighter moments, but the problem is that tough gangsters would not giggle about poo like a bunch of 14-year-old boys. This anime just can't decide who these characters are. And the last hugely problematic thing with the story is the whole, you know, time travel element. Dude gets saved by Takemichi once and just comes out and decides that a, he went back in time. B, that he can go back in time again. C, that he will go back in time exactly 12 years every single time. D, that he does this by shaking his hand. And E, that the handshake comes from saving him one time because obviously it does. Why would he know literally any part of this? Now, he is the one that saved him from the train the first time, so maybe it'll turn out that he's actually responsible for every part of this or something, but the fact that the story just ejaculates this all over the second episode and expects you to lap it up without questioning is fucking alarming, to say the least. This would be an inoffensively fun, if kind of predictable, and at least moderately poorly written gang drama if it were at all possible to take this story seriously, but basically everything in this story relies on these characters being rampantly violent delinquents, and this just does not work when they're ogling over their shiny new uniforms like they finally got their masturbation scarred hands on some supreme merch and a few cans of prime. Knowing Knowing, I really wanted to like because it's just so 
weird. And if there's anything we need more of these days, it's weird shit. Instead, we have mountains and mountains and mountains of cookie cutter isekai oozing out of the asshole of every studio with the budget for a handful of underpaid animators to squirt out an adaptation of whatever terrible light novel they managed to get their grubby little hands on. Whereas here, everyone's dressed in black rags like they got lost on the way to a BDSM party at the hipster convention. Not to mention the heavy amount of rope all over their arms and bodies and genitals and attached to them like anchors slash choke collars as they dive back and forth through space time. But the problem with weird anime is... <sighs> that the weirdness is pretty often the source of almost every single problem with the story. See, My Chemical Romance here is supposed to be the future version of each of the kids. Well, one possible future anyway. Well, the kinky one, anyway. And the story keeps flipping back and forth between the kids and the future people trying to save every dimension in all of space-time. But almost every single scene with the Kink Squad is either them fighting with completely inconsistent superpowers that are literally never explained, or ejaculating loads and loads of exposition that's just a bunch of made-up words covered in whatever sciencey sounding drivel the writers could come up with, leaving them with motivations that are so paper-thin they change almost every goddamn episode. I mean, I swear, almost every one of these people fights almost every single other one at some point in the story. Now, the kids I liked, because they felt so real, or specifically the parents, because they're the ones who go through the most character development as the kids sort out all their domestic problems problems, which is a surprising but very, very welcome change of pace. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, all of the yes. But then all of this just exacerbates the problem of why we're spending so much time with the future people, because not only do they more resemble the Blue Man group than any of the kids, their future is basically not explained, so the story would not change if that were literally them. It's like you showing me pictures of the poo you dressed up in a cute little hat and started calling Mr. Tinkles because it used to be a beautiful strawberry cake, and while that's technically true, I think I'd be forgiven for wondering why the fuck you think I would actually care. What's with the superpowers and the outfits and the giant robot monsters making everyone live in a freaky underground sex dungeon? Well, you see, this dimension is just one of infinite possibilities. No, no, Kate, stop, bitch. I get that part. I don't care about the dimensions you didn't show. Explain the one that you did. No? Not even a little bit. Now you're right, I guess the fashion speaks for itself, Jesus. What we're left with is a half-compelling story about family and friendship, and half a completely garbled fucking mess that's somehow both extremely over and underwritten at the exact same time. Knowing exemplifies the label I gave to C-tier, maybe more than any other anime on this list. Flawed. It's something that could have been truly great if it weren't also so fucking terrible. You know, what a lot of these stories need is a good hard slap to the face. Someone to say, hey, maybe, idiot, this should not be a time travel story. Endless summer is ironically about how time is fleeting and all things do come to an end. Utah, visiting his relatives in the country, gets sent to his grandfather's body in the past in a time before the dam is built and the valley is flooded and everyone gets relocated to the city. And so he gets to appreciate an ephemeral moment lost to the sands of time. Beautiful, yet short-lived, just like the town's sea of glowing fireflies. It's a really cute movie, but tell me, would this not be better if it were just told from the point of view of his grandfather without the time travel element? If the dam were just this impending threat on a bunch of kids who don't want to say goodbye to their town and eventually had to come to terms with their place in the world as life goes on? Instead, the dam is a foregone conclusion, so we're just kind of left accepting how the world is from the start, which only undermines the entire message that time is fleeting. Not necessarily a bad movie per se, but if this were a person, most people would probably pass up on a second date in light of it pissing itself in the middle of the restaurant. Hello World. Hello World is like one of those stories with its head all the way up its own ass, only it took it back out when it realized how bad it is for your posture and didn't clean the poo off its nose. In short, reality is a simulation, but also reality exists so the main character's future self come to save his soon-be girlfriend who dies in an accident by saving her in the virtual world and then taking her to the real world, being all coy about which one is the real world until it decides that that's too confusing using and just spells it out for you because you're a stupid, stupid weeabo. Basically, Inception, but a simulation instead of dreams. Seriously, 
I get it. Inception was awesome and all, but can we move on now? Like, seriously, what? Thankfully, it doesn't actually focus too much on this and generally plays the story for what it is. It's mostly about the differences between him and his future self. And when his future self starts working against him, it starts bringing into question whether or not it's still him and how much and what the two of them existing together really means. Thoughtful in a lot of ways, but I'm putting it into C tier because most of the plot just gets pulled right from the dirty asshole of anime logic. Like, instead of just being philosophical and shit, what with the simulation and all, the protagonist gets to have the magic fist of doom that allows him to pull anything and everything out of thin air, so literally every bit of conflict is completely arbitrary. Uh, does he have the power to do the thing? Sure, why the fuck not? Who gives a shit? Uh, certainly not the writers, so why the hell would you? Here's an idea, don't give him superpowers. Nothing about the themes or the plot really demand them. It's almost like they're only there to just Justify this movie being done in 3D. Which leads us to the other issue, which is that this is a great case study for what does and doesn't work in 3D because while it mostly looks good, a couple scenes stand out more than a white elephant at an orgy because they really, really do not. And I have no idea why anyone thought it would be a good idea to do them. Popotan. Popotan is. How do I put this? horrible, horrible clickbait. It starts with classically underage boys stumbling upon a house of four naked girls and funneling their boobies like a good little weeb, but then the episode's ending is very suspiciously not terrible and Popotan quickly starts pulling back the layers before dropping the act altogether and blindsiding you with something really deep. The four girls, you see, are ghosts or something on a journey across time, disappearing and reappearing again at some point in the future. And so, the question at the heart of it is, What's the point of meeting people, of making friends with the people in each era if they're just going to disappear again? And the answer that each of them comes to is that their relationships aren't valuable despite being fleeting, but rather because they are. It's a remarkably profound story about treasuring each moment and each person in your life as they come. Uh, let me take the cock back out of my mouth before this starts to sound like a recommendation, though. Don't watch this anime. See, the only reason I put up with all of its bullshit to see the story through is because I made myself watch 100% of literally every time travel anime like an idiot, please like and subscribe, in order to review and or shit on them all. That is not you. If I were not doing this, I would have given up midway through the second episode, if not the first. And all of this just makes me wonder what the hell is with all the titties? On one hand, it's nice to be pleasantly surprised. I mean, this is basically the heart of the whole brownie identity that was all the rage 10 years ago. Seriously, the show is fine, but if it wasn't a children's show, none of them would have so much given it the time of day, let alone drawn all that furry porn. So as someone who's suffered a healthy amount of brain damage in writing this video, I welcome surprise. I really do. But on the other, is just at odds with the rest of the story. If I try to think about what it gains from being like this, I literally cannot come up with anything. It's just the most vapid shit presented without even a hint of self-awareness. It just holds out nudity on a platter as of saying, you may now masturbate. And honestly, that's kind of a turnoff. At least buy me dinner and fondle my balls a little. Dear God, what am I going on about? Besides this, the other problem is that as a side effect of all the rampant fan service, only one of the four girls Girls is left with any real personality, and the others have maybe enough to fill a half an actual character between them. I want to say don't encourage this kind of bullshit and pretend the anime doesn't exist, but as it turns out, it's too late. Because if, like me, you've been on the internet for long enough, you've seen Popotan. You might not think you have, but you have. Because Popotan is where the caramel dancing girls come from. <laughs> Surprised? Yes, as anime gets more and more degenerate every year, I can't help but at least partially blame this horrible meme. Fuck you, Popotan, it's your fault. I sometimes get comments asking how to think about stories the way I do, and the thing is, I'm not sure it's something I can teach because to me, it's simple. I merely listen. A story has a voice. It's not the author's voice or any characters. To me, stories themselves are living, breathing creatures with their own thoughts and feelings and ideas, and all I do is sit down and shut the fuck up and listen. The best writers, you see, don't write. 
they listen. There's the gardener who like digs a hole in the ground and puts in a seed and waters it with his blood and he sees what comes up. They listen for the faint heartbeat of a story and merely share what it has to say. You're not putting words into the characters' mouths, you're listening to them. They talk on their own and you just follow along behind. Calvin and Hobbes wrote their own material. Their friendship was not so much constructed as revealed. So the reason I bring this up is because Bokutachi no Remakes writers didn't just not listen to their own story, they kicked it in the balls, tied cement blocks to its feet, and dumped it in the fucking river. See, dude thinks himself a failure and wishes to go back in time and attend art school instead of business school so he could have pursued his dreams and be like all the artists he looks up to. And the kicker is, he never needed to go back. He got his dream job right before going back, but the team got laid off in a round of budget cuts. He was always exactly the person he wanted to be, he just needed a little more patience. And so when he goes back in time, he's successful because he always was, and as a result, all these artists he looked up to in the future instead start to look up to him as he accidentally warps everyone's ideas of art around his corporate brain-damaged ideas of success. And the underlying moral of the story is to stop comparing yourself and your life to others and to make art for the sake of it because art only feels real when it's made with passion and a heart. It's a lovely message that it completely undermines in almost every episode. For one, it can't help but bury its head up the dirty asshole of anime tropes. Tits, 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 lolly, yep, checks out. I can't possibly be the only one that sees the irony of doing this to a story about making art instead of sniffing dirty capitalist money-grabbing farts. But not only this, it willingly throws itself in the shadow of other better anime. I thought the emotional piano motif sounding almost exactly like Kimi no Nawa's was probably a coincidence. But then it went and did this. Really? They just did Haruhi's Amiya? Wow, I have so many problems with this. The first is. At best, if your anime isn't better, which, let's be honest, if you're doing this, it definitely fucking isn't, you're just inviting negative comparisons. But the other thing is, they're not just doing the Haruhi Suzumiya song. This is the final performance at a school festival for a girl that wants everyone to see her and tell her that her existence is worth something, and also she's wearing a sexy outfit. There's a difference between alluding to something else and just aping its emotional climax beat for beat. This isn't so much doing Haruhi Suzumiya as it is wearing a prosthetic mask and taking out a credit card in its name. I get that this takes place in 2006 when this anime was the shit, but here's a thought. Other popular music came out in 2006? What, does music just not exist to you outside of anime? Holy crap! Your story is about having the confidence to do your own thing, to make art, and it's like, hey, we are now that anime you like! The worst part of Bokutachi no Remake is the end when he wakes up in the new future when all of his classmates have given up art. But then as they each finally realize that they were trying to live up to the warped expectations they created for themselves and go back to making art, he's like, yeah, no, wait, I want to go back in time again. And then he does, which is just, no, 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 no. No, 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 oh my god, I have no idea how they fucked this up so damn hard, but as a writer, this hurts my brain to watch. Galileo Donna. Galileo Donna is an almost impressively silly anime about the descendants of Galileo avoiding kidnapping with a massive fucking airship the 14-year-old built in her free time by herself along with a suit of invincible power armor. Oh, you know, kids are getting so smart these days, just casually building unprecedented weapons of war in their free time between their busy school schedules of studying, talking about cute boys, and masturbation. Now, there's suspension of disbelief, and then there's taking out back an old yellering it before telling the kids it digivolved into a goldfish-shaped airship. See, everyone in the world has an almost psychotic obsession with Galileo and the legendary treasure he left behind. Like, the writers came up with this after watching The Da Vinci Code and snorting coke off a bunch of gunpla. Here's a fun game. Watch this and take a shot every time one of the characters says the word heliocentric and try not to black out by the end of the night. Oh, there's another one down the hatch! 
Oh! The main problem with this anime, though, is just how fucking masturbatory it all is. The anime, I mean, that was a joke. Besides the, let's be honest, weirdly fetishistic obsession with Galileo, there is this bit where all the characters talk about how cool and unique a country Japan is, and how they all totally want to go visit there, and the time travel thing is literally an excuse to have one of the characters, and I swear I'm not making this up, eat traditional Japanese candy with Galileo because he loves it and eats it all the time while he works. Again, less a suspension of disbelief and more a firing squad. Oh, and the three girls are half Japanese and half Italian, because of course they are. This feels like Galileo fanfiction written by a Japanese high schooler, which isn't like far off from what this actually is, but it feels weird to say out loud and even weirder to say that I liked it. Maybe it's that I watched this immediately after Punchline, but I found the silliness charming in a crayon drawing by a two-year-old sort of way, but I'm not ranking it any higher because it's really not good. It's hard to imagine calling an anime this beautiful kind of unremarkable, but I guess here we are because after watching it as Zuko, I'd written down fucking gorgeous and not much else. Imagine a basic slice of life anime, but overflowing with more rainbows and pretty colors than a pool of leprechaun jizz. Everything about this seriously pops. Not super surprising once I realized this was done by PA Works, the same studio that did my favorite slice of life anime ever, Shiroi Suno no Aquatope, and if you woke up and turned this on after a few too many strong zeros, it might even take you a bit to realize that it isn't the same show. But my problem with Irazuku is the romance, because the boy is by far the least interesting character in the story, which is a problem because the point of the girl is that she doesn't have emotions. Imagine if Violet Evergarden was a wizard with a really, really shitty high school romance instead of profound emotional catharsis, and you basically have this anime. I felt so little chemistry between them that when they finally started getting the moves on, it was more awkward to watch than two beached whales trying to fuck with a strap on. Like, wait, what? You like his art, and he likes your magic? But, um, okay, look, I know teenagers don't really need a reason to bone other than they were horny, but maybe skip the realism in your anime about a magic fairy does shop around the corner, okay? The dumb part is, it would have just been straight up better if there were absolutely no romance in it because the plot would be almost exactly the same. Uh, so, uh, then why? Because slice of life, I guess. Shit. Shiroi Suna no Aquatope doesn't have any real romance, so maybe they learn from this one, but jeez, dude. Hopefully your next slice of life is less like this and more like Aquatope. Can I ask you something? What's with all the emotionless robotic waifus in anime? What, is this some kind of weird fetish that people have? Kind of like taking a girl's virginity, you also take her first cry, preferably at the same time? Because Sakurada Reset is like the fourth anime with this trope just on this list. There's Irozuku, Vivi, in search of something original, and now we have Sakurada Reset, about a girl with superpowers that can turn back time. What I like about this, though, is that while something like Violet Ever Garden uses Violet's struggle with emotions as the catalyst for the unrestrained exploration of human emotion, Sakurada Reset uses Haruki as a blank slate to reflect all its ideas and philosophies, and hearing her robotically air out her completely normal feelings comes across as both very off, yet still very human. So it's kind of like Charlotte, where everyone has flawed superpowers, and Haruki has the ability to reset time but can't remember when she does. So she teams up with Kei, whose superpower is remembering everything, so he remembers every time the world resets and never figured out why until he met her, and they form a cool superhero club together. And the kicker is that the emotionally stunted Haruhi keeps getting reset every time something important happens, and because she can never remember resetting, she keeps getting denied the growth she's constantly searching for as she struggles to come out of her shell over the course of the story. What we get is this atmosphere that feels both extremely melancholic and yet very, very funny, even though there's very few actual jokes in it. And building on this is the way we just get thrown into scenes as they start happening with minimal context, which gives the story this tangible quality that only adds to the melancholy. The main problem I have with this show, and the one I expect a lot of people to have, is that this, combined with all the philosophy the story is seeped in, makes it also very, very 
dense. I actually was gonna put it higher until I got utterly absorbed in Bunny Girl Senpai again and realized that it basically does everything Sakurada Reset was trying to do but better, while also being extremely breezy and witty. If a dense, melancholic, and philosophical slice of life anime sounds appealing to you, you might still like it. I did, but there is a chance you might just find it kind of boring. Summertime Renda. Well, the single greatest sin in storytelling is forgetting to make you care about the story. There are a number of other sins. One of them is reminding you that you're watching a story. Now, not that there aren't clever, interesting, and ironic ways to do this, see the first episode of Steins Gate for a goddamn case study in this, but summertime rendering, like so many goddamn horrible, etchy anime, just slams fan service in your face literally just for the same of fan service, which puts a screeching halt on whatever interesting development is going on. It says, hey, did you forget that you're watching anime? Because you're watching anime. Thank you, Summertime Rendering. I almost got absorbed in your interesting narrative about time loops and dead girls and shadow demons. Thank God you pulled me out of it. Wouldn't want to enjoy an anime for the story. That wouldn't make sense. Christ. The problem here is the time loop mechanic. Instead of using it for a story about, say, existential dread, Summertime Rendering has Shinpei start later and later every time, driving a sense of urgency for him to unravel the mystery of the island. It's the kind of pacing that draws you further and further into the story with every single loop, or it would if it didn't have to again. Slam on the brakes every fucking time with him being buried face first into some bouncy titties and or his sister's panties and or his other sister's panties. Obviously, I still found this compelling overall, but seeing all these anime that could be something more if they just took their head out of their ass makes me sad. I was actually gonna put this in B tier, and maybe I still would if this was the only anime I've ever seen, but when I thought about it, I decided that I really do not want to reward this kind of behavior because I'm honestly sick of this fucking shit. But so by now you're probably thinking, wow, this is somehow both the funniest and most insightful anime video I've ever seen, but if there's one thing wrong with it, it's that all these anime I've never heard of are maybe a little too relevant. Hmm? No? You're not? Oh, uh, well, here's about 20 different really short and really bad OVA for you to mull over while I reconsider the concept of this video. Yeah, most of them are far too short and obscure to really give a shit, so in the interest of completion, I decided to lump them together into their own tier list. What? A tier list inside a tier list? Tier listception? Be careful, we're starting to approach aggressive, nay, dangerous levels of weeaboo. If tia. You know, it would have been so much easier to just lump all of these together under D tier for being almost impressively bland and generic, but no! Anime like Hourglass of Summer have to ruin this by going the extra mile and being impressively bland and generic. So, congratulations, you go in the F bin with all the other comrades. You know, a weird, but I guess not quite super surprising effect of all these OVAs being so obscure is that an alarming number of them caused people who watched them to turn into clueless hipsters who don't understand why their favorite fuck-off OVA isn't more popular despite them rating it a 9 or a 10. Well, here's why, idiot. They fucking suck and so does your taste in anime. Imagine Slaughterhouse-Five if Kurt Vonnegut was speedrunning the anime bingo card and you basically have this anime, only it also ends with the girl being saved basically by coincidence, making this two episode OVA feel somehow both rushed and at least twice as long and ten times as pointless as it should have been. Jesus. Yahabe. Imagine if some random Chinese company made a badly animated 3D shard ripping off Yu-Gi-Oh, except the pyramid is a secret government weapon that can do anything and control time, and also it was shit. Uruda. Imagine, if you will, a movie about time travelers fighting kung fu Nazis. Now imagine this isn't an 80s Hollywood B-movie, and instead some of the worst 3D animation ever created. If this sounds delightfully shitty, now imagine that the voice acting is also noticeably shitty. Japanese voice acting is so good that until watching these OVAs, I'd literally never once sat down in front of an anime and been like, wow. 
This is kind of bad, but this is the little push Urdu needed to make it absolutely terrible. I mean, there's one part where they're fighting with broken parts of the plane on top of said plane, and the Nazi fucking cuts through it like it's a lightsaber or something. Bro, what? Grab your closest friends and some drinks, because this is easily one of the worst things I've ever seen, and you kind of have to see this. DTA. Bowling, time paradigm, Sakura. It's amazing how much depth time travel can add to any concept. No, wait, that's not right. Let's try that again. It's amazing what you can get away with if you just pretend your sad card captor Sakura ripoff is a time travel anime, so it's totally different, right? If you just replaced all the time related words in Time Paladin Sakura with different places, I actually don't think I could tell the difference. Yes, them battling space monsters at a random point in the past, they only had the budget for one, is like totally time travel if you plug your ears and kind of squint a little. This is the point where I started regretting committing to literally every single time travel anime, but well, sometimes we just have to hurt ourselves to remember that we're still alive. Twilight Q. Mm, oh, this is new, starting with the claim that this anime will change my reality. Very bold, I accept Twilight Q. Show me what you've got. Bring me to my knees with your world bending mind fucking mind-shattering story. I'm ready and willing to have my reality turned upside down by whatever new experience lies in wait behind your- Oh, it's just another Slaughterhouse-Five ripoff again, but marginally less shit this time for whatever that statement is worth. You know, if it weren't for this and the title, I would have never guessed that this was even supposed to be the Twilight Zone. I mean, it's not even trying to screw with you. Literally, girl finds a camera from the future, gets Slaughterhouse-Fived a little, end of story, I'd say this is sniffing its own farts, but it isn't even doing that. It's farting and then running away and leaving you in the room as the smell wafts around a little. Not even offensive, just confusing. And then one more episode that almost has to be trying to fail the pretentiousness test because Jesus Christ, this is bad. I'm sorry, I tried. I tried to come up with something interesting to say about literally every time travel anime, but I just can't come up with anything to say about Savannah and Horse. It's a generic Mongolian fairy tale about peace. That's it. That's literally it. I can't even fathom why this was made in the first place, so what could I possibly say about it? Fuck me, man. I tried. I swear I tried. I'm sorry. Dear God, I'm such a failure. Garas no chikyu wo sukue. Uniko tokubetsu hen. Uh, here's something that might come across as a surprise to you. Bad preachy edutainment cartoons get made in Japan too. Well, on one hand, it was weird to hear the riddle of the Sphinx not in English and from an anime about saving the environment. On the other hand, this anime does answer the other riddle, which is, what if the Sphinx was a cat girl waifu with really huge tits? Uh, alarming to see in a children's environmental cartoon starring motherfucking Astro Boy, but I guess now we know where Beatstars came from. The message is basically stop consuming so much, you dirty capitalist sheep, which fair enough for being 20 years old, although it would have been good if the message was a little less corporate and a little more productive, but maybe taking a swing at big oil or the government would have been a little too aggressive for children's media in the country that makes half of the world's cars. If I were being really cynical, I'd maybe point out that Japan is still on the same glass earth project that was started back in 1996, and look where we are now, what with two more movies produced for this pretty recently, but I mean, I guess it's a cute little movie with a nice message barf. Kirara, Kirara is a perfect example of why your 40 minute OVA shouldn't be philosophical. Basically, boy meets girl, and she dies on their wedding day, and her ghost goes back in time to when they first met so she can finally get that D. A D tier, maybe. So it's this weird love triangle where a couple destined to marry is haunted by one of them from the future, leaving a lot of interesting questions to be answered. Where did she come from? Is this still her? Will she be there forever? How do they come to terms with the existence of the three of them? Sadly, it runs out of time before it can answer any of these questions and basically just ends, making it a barely elevated etchy piece that should really have been a hentai. Sequence. Sequence had me up until the part where stuff happens. Oh, you were 
were so close. Basically, dude was a psychic space warrior in a past future life, but lost all his space memories of his space love triangle with his space best friend and space lover who accidentally space killed him and now is trying to space find him and have lots of space babies together. Another example of anime just waving time travel in front of the viewer like it's a magical spell that will somehow make it less terrible, but I feel like I could physically measure the lack of effort that went into writing this because the dude's name is literally Sadamon. Like, fuck me, like... Uh, how you are, you just have to say that you're fine uh, when you're not really uh, fine, but you just can't get into it because they would never understand. Basically, it spends the entire runtime setting up a love triangle and then throws both women out the window as he goes, ha ha, I can get lots of bitches, which, can we just... Can we just... Oh, god damn it. You know, after watching all these terrible, bland, generic OVAs, I'm starting to think this video might have actually been a really terrible idea. Like, if I told you this anime involves a young girl aspiring to be an artist because of an old tapestry, when a dude from the Edo period suddenly appears in front of her, do you even need me to finish this Emblem Take 2? Emblem Take 2 is something I thought I might like, but just walked away confused, because literally all that happens is dude dies, and then goes in back in time to redo his Yakuza life, but his only real goal is be less suck, which I guess is motivation enough if you're 10 years old and not a member of the Japanese mafia. The best way I can describe this is a Yakuza slice of life, but the problem with a lot of these OVAs is that they're adaptations of manga or visual novels, but they never had a real budget, so instead of, you know, trying to tell a shorter fucking story, they just make something limper and more full of holes than this non-existent dick joke. Expo Speaking of having no budget, Expert Xenon is what happens when a terrible writer runs out of budget to make their terrible anime because entire swaths of the story have just been left out, or at least that's what it feels like when the main character of this uncomfortably generic video game battle royale anime just turns to the girl and says, you can rewind time, right? After being given zero indication that she could do that or literally anything else. Huh? What? She can? What the shit? The girl who has zero memories and knows literally nothing except the rules of the game that she was too stupid to tell you about. Uh, when exactly did she have the time to tell you about her random time traveling powers? Oh, never. Jesus, it wouldn't be as stupid if it didn't so thoroughly establish that she knows and says nothing of value. If your script is a page long and half your page is illegible from all the cum stains, I expect you to at least know what the other half says. Not that any of this is the least bit relevant. For one, the girl never actually ends up doing anything, begging the question why this was even brought up in the first place. But also, the entire thing is a game played by people in the the future by changing the past and then erasing the past as if it never happened, which is stupid on like so many levels that it's almost so bad that it's actually good, but mostly it's just shit. Okay, so this is a fucking weird one. Not the actual story, god forbid we actually do something new. This is about high school girls doing cute and or cute adjacent things. Again, no, what I mean is that this was a weird mixed media project that included a manga, light novel, and 30 minutes OVA representing the beginning, middle, and end of this story. Yes, why be creative with your story when you could just shit out a creative way to sell it and say bon appetit, sheep? Okay, maybe that's a little harsh, but it feels like the type of thing that someone wrote because they thought it'd be a cool idea, rather than because it has actual literary merit. All of this rambling is just to say that I'm obviously not going to read a manga and a light novel just to watch a terrible short anime, so maybe I'm about to talk out of my ass here, but also as the king of weeaboos, I am kind of the goat when it comes of this kind of thing. So, girls go to the future to find a way to save it, mostly screw around for 20 minutes before breaking a cell phone, future is saved, Q feels. Huh? Sorry, what? Breaking a cell phone? Her cell phone had all the messages from her boyfriend, so I guess the thing that was keeping the future in check was her lingering feelings that she had to get rid of to sever the connection to the past. Except when they break it and the past comes in, her boyfriend takes her hand, which kind of throws that out the window, and I feel like even if I read the novel, there'd still be something missing here, because it basically just ends with no explanation. Also, not only are the characters aggravating in the classic, hey, look at how cute and quirky they are, 
Jafar sort of way. This absolutely reeks of insert cry here writing, and I think we could do a little better than that. In short, the only reason to watch this is if you had to watch every time travel anime like an idiot, please like and subscribe, but you don't, so let's just cut the review here and slam it in with the others. If I told you there was a 15 minute short anime made in 2018 advertising a city in Japan by having someone time travel 50 years in the future and meet their own grandchild, would you guess that this is actually two different anime about two different cities made by the same company at the exact same time? Bro, I think someone got scammed here. Kimi no Matsubashale is about as dull as you'd expect. Here's our city and 15 minutes about why it's so cool and why it will be even cooler in 50 years when this anime takes place. Here's this fun bridge we have. No, seriously, this is our bridge. Please be impressed. Ah, uh, okay. But the message it seems to want you to take away is that it's nicer to live in than Tokyo, which is odd because Soka is basically the suburbs of Tokyo. Seriously, it's like 20 kilometers away from the city center. Half your population probably commutes there and the other half probably considers this Tokyo anyway because hello? Itsuka Ayaru Kimi ni instead thought it'd be more interesting to miss the mark completely and instead shoot itself in the foot by going for the flying car version of the future. Fair enough, it's more interesting, but I can't be the only one who sees the fundamental problem with this. A flying car, a floating butler robot, transport tubes, apparently just Singapore for some reason even though this is an ad for a Japanese city. If this is meant to advertise your city, why are you not showing us A, your actual city, B, your actual plans for your actual city, or C, at the very least, not fucking Singapore. This colossal waste of money is why we made the irrelevant OVA tier. Fire tripper. Okay, so you know how I said no isekai type stories, right? Well, fire tripper is the answer to the question. Okay, well, what if not that, but instead just that three times? Uh, well, shit, I guess you got me there. I mean, you'd think this story about a girl that can time travel by dying in a horrible fire would be cool, but instead it goes absolutely nowhere as she's sentenced to a depressingly generic love story where she gets to hook up with a six-year-old. The thing you'll notice about a lot of bad, quote, romance anime is that they just kind of take for granted that the characters are supposed to bone, which is something you'd think would be jarring to anyone who spent any amount of time talking to real people. Granted, this is kind of a high bar for weeaboos, but if, after watching it, the only thing I could tell you about each of their personalities is that she's good with kids like a good little uterus, and that he only tries to rape her when he's too drunk to do it, there's probably something wrong. Fair enough, Middle Ages men weren't exactly known for their chivalry, but the the fact that she gives up her life to live in a hole with him instead of the other way around is a little eh... Ontama. Ontama is a little too cutesy to the point where you kind of want to slap each of the characters upside the face a little. But there's more going on here for people who can look past that. I mean, it starts with this weirdly dark bit about a girl running away from home and her abusive stepfather, so that's kind of new. The only problem here is that she goes back in time to bring her mother and real father together and live happily ever after, only... Uh, clearly they were together at some point and broke up, so getting them together in the first place doesn't actually solve anything. And that's when you realize it's a little more than what it appears to be. Heartwarming, assuming you didn't puke a little watching the clips I used for this review. Question, why is this on my anime list? This is a two minute internet short made by some random dude and not a popular one either. It has like 3000 views. I mean, I guess it's pretty good for what it is, but this would be like putting Final Fantasy Guild Quest on IMDb. I know we love Japanese animation, but there has to be a limit to what we consider anime. Oh my god, I'm the problem. B -tier. Good to. Time driver. No, wait, let's take back what I just said, because if it weren't for this shitty two-minute anime, I would have not discovered this animator's newest and actually professionally produced under a special young animator grant work, Time Driver, which is about a man whose childhood fantasy of a dream-powered robot that can travel through space and time to fight despair shows up with younger him to save the world. But as an adult, he's forgotten the power of imagination until he visits the Tree of Dreams where he's reminded of a letter he wrote to his future self. 
It's a really cute story about how children have the freedom to dream, but adults have the power to bring those dreams to life, so you're never too old for the power of imagination. I wanna say, if you're gonna watch any of these OVAs, you should watch Time Driver, but it actually hasn't been translated into English. Sad. Aoyama Gosho Tanpenshu. Okay, so there's something that's really starting to bother me about time travel anime. At first, I thought it was a coincidence that both the Steinsgate movie and Kimi no Nawa have characters disappear because of time travel. But this came out in 1999, and it has the exact same motherfucking plot device. Bitch, I know Aoyama did invent this entire plot device for a 20-minute short. This has to be a play on some kind of trope, right? Seriously, I need to know where this is from. Oh, the anime is kind of cool, I guess. It's the classic stupid genius that wants the time travel to be the same age as his girlfriend, but the twist here is that she grabs his time machine and does it instead and almost dies for love and stuff. It's cutesy and quirky, and someone tell me I'm going to go fucking insane, oh my god! Okay, so I realize this is something I could probably only figure out if I literally became Japanese, so I shit you not, I spent hours and hours over weeks researching in Japanese to try and find the bottom of- No, just kidding, I made a post on 5chan. <laughs> okay, now that we've sifted through all the garbage and post-garbage, we can finally get to some anime I'd be willing to call good without qualification. Not that they don't still need some, just the standout qualities make you forget about the flaws wafting in like the distant aroma of dried cum, at least until they try to shake your hand. How do you make a follow-up to the most legendarily pretentious anime of all time? Well, first, uh, don't, that sounds like a nightmare waiting to happen, because being pretentious is a lot like being offensive. You have to be more meaningful than you are pretentious, but, well, I guess for a limp sequel they certainly could have done a lot worse. Basically, they discover a time machine, and then go back in time, and then realize that they might create a paradox that causes the universe to implode, so they chase after themselves going back in time to try and stop it, and everything they intentionally and unintentionally do is just how things already happen. You know, the classic paradox, where it's impossible to create a paradox because you trying to stop yourself from jerking off with a hose actually causes you, in a completely roundabout kind of way, to jerk off with a hose. Imagine that, but if, like, instead of a movie or an anime, it was a movie-length series of anime shorts for some reason. Tatami Blues feels like the writers saw the original and were like, okay, violently pretentious, we can do that, totally. Interesting, sure, but my problem is that it mostly stops there. In the original, every character could have been even thicker and duller than my cock, but you wouldn't know because the entire thing is told through the lens of the cynical, bumbling idiot of a protagonist, coating it in a fat layer of irony. But Blues is, for some reason, not, and so every character but him and Oz comes across as flat and boring in comparison. More importantly though, I just didn't feel like it had very much to say. Not that it didn't try, but when it thoroughly establishes that nothing matters and the future is set in stone, it kind of undermines any meaning it ever had. Obviously, I still put this in B tier, but I'm not just gonna sit here and praise an anime for just being witty, because we as consumers really need to demand a little fucking more than this. Oh, I like Thing. I wanna pay money for the Thing again. I don't even care if it's good. I just wanna hand over my money like a good little sheep. Fuck you. Sure, this one's decent, but this is how you get shit like Steins Gate Zero. Your willingness to part with money doesn't correlate to good sequel, and in fact, it almost always means the exact opposite. Just let stories die already. God. Orange. Speaking of things in B tier that make me angry though, orange, because, okay, wait, hold on. 16 year old Naho wakes up one day to a letter from herself, 10 years in the future, telling her how to avoid a lifetime of regret. Now, this has the stinky stag of Izakai, but it's elevated by, well, I won't spoil it, but there's something that's just kind of dropped on you that completely changes the tone of this story in a very, very big way. There is, however, one major reason it's going all the way down to the very bottom of B tier, and that's because of, uh, well, the time travel thing. Apparently, the way they managed to send letters to the past is using a black hole discovered in the Bermuda Triangle, and that is just, holy shit, there's just so many things wrong with that sentence. Actually, what the hell? And the worst part is, it doesn't even try to explain it. It just goes, you know, black holes, and then stops there. 
Why even bother? I know Steinsgate had a bunch of ridiculous black hole shit, but it was written by people who at least understand the laws of physics. Here's an idea. Don't explain how the letters came to the past. Seriously, we don't even need to know. There's these scenes of their future selves talking about wanting to change the past. It only really seemed to serve as a vehicle to explain what is possibly the single dumbest implementation of time travel ever made. And looking at how many anime there are on this list, that is saying a lot. Just leave the letters and the future a mystery. It's okay to use a little magic. In fact, for most of the enemy on this list, the explanation is, we did a magic. Seriously, it sounds like something someone wrote as a joke, and yet it's played completely seriously in this extremely heavy slice of life anime about depression. Oh, did I mention that's what it's about? Because that's what it's about. You might be surprised to see a race this far up if you've, you know, seen it. I mean, calling the ending a disappointment would be an understatement. Saying it wet itself before tripping face first into a pile of its own shame might even be underselling it. I put this in the middle of B tier? Well, if you'll just hold on to your cocks for a hot minute, maybe I can surprise you twice with this one. Erased is about this jaded, aspiring manga artist with this superpower that pulls him back in time at critical moments to save people's lives. It sets you up for this kick-ass time travel superhero story, but then goes Psych, bitch! And sends him back 18 years to fifth grade and turns into this serial killer murder mystery story where he's stuck in a child's body with only vague clues from the future to help him. And because the murderer targeted neglected and lonely kids, he saves them in more ways than one. By being a friend. It was, or is, fantastic, at least until the aforementioned infamous face-pissingly bad ending. So the people that went and fixed this were the Netflix live action team. What? That's at least two words that don't make sense together. Maybe this is less of a surprise if you've seen Alice in Borderland, but the Japan Netflix team isn't run by smelly smelly weeaboos. Here's how they fixed it. They, um, just put in the manga ending. <sighs> Now, by fixed, I mean they overcompensated harder than a gorilla in a Corvette because this ends and then goes on for another 20 minutes like it's fucking Lord of the Rings or something. This was 12 25 minute episodes. Well, 11. Suzumiya Haruhi no Shoshitsu. Yeah, I know, I said no stupid time travel movies, but here's the thing. A weird number of weeaboos seem to consider this the best anime movie ever, so fine. I'll make one exception, but it's gonna be short though, because fuck you. I like it because it fills in the other side of the story. While Haruhi pretends to want the extraordinary, what she really wants is the ordinary. Kion is the one that pretends to want peace and quiet, but what he really wants is the extraordinary. Each of them is only really meaningful in the context of the other, so the movie feels like the complete picture, rather than the loose jumble of events that is melancholy. So is this the best anime movie ever? It's excellent, sure, I guess in the context that most anime movies are cheap cash grabs, then it's goddamn stellar, but best ever? Really? I don't know, man. But if you've seen Melancholy, you basically have to watch this, and if you haven't seen the melancholy of Haruhi Suzumiya, I mean, what are you doing with your life, am I right? There, weebs, are you happy? No, of course not, he only moderately showered it with praise. Oh no, he doesn't think the three and a half hour long episode of Haruhi Suzumiya is the pinnacle of animation. Boho. That's right, what are you gonna do about it, fucking weeaboo? Nothing. That's what I thought. Higurashi no nakukoro ni. I often question why anime has to be so hyper cutesy or edgy, but I guess when you leave people alone on an island for hundreds of years, you don't get to be surprised when they start trying to fuck a volleyball they painted with their own blood. So when you see Higurashi come in, take a look at all of anime, and just kind of say yes, you really expect to hate it, especially when it takes this and does a horror story of all things, and yet somehow it's quite good. The difference between this and the typical bullshit clumsily sprayed all over most anime like a game of soggy biscuit though is intent and pacing. In normal anime, the wank is the end goal, but in Higurashi, it's merely the means to the end, the mystery. Subversive would be a good word for it, which makes sense when you realize this was an indie visual novel. What Higurashi does is juxtapose the almost violently saccharine slice of life bits and the wildly over-the-top horror bits and use their sheer contrast to catch you off guard and create a surreal mystery about a quiet village where people have been coming down with a bad case of being murdered. 
murdered. So as a story, it is far more than the sum of its parts. The problem with Higurashi though is something I didn't pick up on until rewatching it for this video, and that's that because literally almost everything is oriented towards serving this mystery, like many a girl taken home after a few too many strong zeros, it doesn't hold up nearly as well on second viewing. Each of the characters being able to snap at any time makes it genuinely unnerving and makes you question what's really going on. But when the answer to who's crazy is all of them, the trade-off is they end up kind of shallow and the story is somewhat lacking in substance once the mystery is gone. This is an even bigger problem in the second half when not only does it stop trying to be scary and all the quirky and cutesy bits just kind of flounder around like a chicken with its dick cut off, most of the mystery is solved, leaving one character to pick up all the loose ends and without the pacing from trying to fuck with you, it just drags on and on. Still, for all of its problems, sometimes there's nothing better than a good mystery well told and if that's you, strong recommend. Not the remake though, dear god. Imagine everything I just said about intent and pacing except rewritten by people who have no idea what those words mean and you have so. Let's just do a quick comparison of the first episode. なかった。Whereas the original adaptation makes you stop and go, huh? So is like, hmm, see, it's crazy. And this is even worse at the episode's ending where Keiichi rifles through old newspapers telling him about the murders. The original is like, uh-oh, there's something going on here. And so is like, ba -na 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 crazy, crazy, big reveal, big, big bang, wee woo, wee woo, wee woo. Which paradoxically will only make sense to people who have seen it, but will piss all of them off because of how much this butchers the tone and the pacing of the story. Uh, bad. Is how I was going to end this review before remembering I committed to watching literally everything, no matter how pointless, and then proceeded to witness, to my surprise, go immediately spoil the entire mystery in the second episode while violently exposition dumping the entire plot and every single character before getting bored and skull fucking the mutilated corpse of the original plot so it can turn into an almost completely unrelated anime. Instead of using the wank to further the mystery, it wipes its ass with the mystery and then pisses all over its smoldering remains so it can, among other things, spend literally half an episode on one of the characters getting disemboweled. I am genuinely impressed with just how bad they managed to make this. Question, why was this even made? None of this makes sense unless you've seen the original, which it somehow both completely abandons and undermines at the exact same time. Literally the only reason I could come up with for this existing is to deliberately piss off Higurashi fans, who I honestly feel bad for because this is some of the laziest, most immature writing I've ever come across, and if this were its own thing, we'd be talking about it down in F tier. Listen, if any companies watching this plan to light all of their money on fire again, call me instead and maybe we can work something out. Bibi, Fluorite Eyes Song. Anime is a lot like jerking off. It's disgusting. No, no, wait, this is wrong. Let, let me start over. Anime, like all storytelling, is a lot like jerking off. No matter how good you are at it, you can never be perfect because it's supposed to be raw. It's supposed to be messy and it's supposed to be real. Even if you were able to create the theoretically perfect fap, that perfection itself would be its downfall. Vivi, Fluorite Eyes Song, is on paper disgusting. No, I mean, God damn it. Vivi, on paper, is the perfect anime. It checks basically every box. Outrageous production value, check. Time travel, check. Kick ass, check. Banging soundtrack, check. Hot waifu learning to feel, check, check, check. It's like they took every single best anime ever and tried to smash them into one super anime. And while this should theoretically make the perfect anime, that perfection itself is its downfall because in pursuit of perfection, it stops taking risks, stops taking the time to be real. A big part of the reason Steins Gate is the greatest anime of all time is that the first 12 episodes are spent giving life to all these characters as they go about their daily lives. It's not just 
personal, it's mundane, it's real. They feel like our friends, not just because we've gotten to know them so well, but because they're all fucking weeaboos, they literally feel like people we know. It's the difference between seeing a character on screen and being able to imagine them jerking off to one of those doujins sitting on the shelf. So Vivi, about a robot waifu guided by a sarcastic time-traveling teddy bear trying to stop Armageddon across an entire century, is trying to be this ridiculously ambitious story, trying to be the next big thing, grandiose yet personal, and on one hand it succeeds, but on the other it's honestly just kind of forgettable because it only does half the work for this. I feel like it wouldn't have even taken that much more to make this twice as long. All the explosive, high budget action stuff is there. What it needs is to slow the fuck down a bit and give us a few episodes where nothing happens. I want to say they did the hard part, but actually what they did is the easy part. Get enough talented artists in a room and making something grand and flashy like this is easy. Anyone can do that. What's hard is the quiet parts. What's hard is having your characters just sit there and do nothing and make that interesting. The show that sold me on the idea that animation is objectively the best storytelling medium is BoJack Horseman. Especially the single best episode of BoJack, which is the one where a poorly animated horse is just standing there talking to himself in a room for the whole damn episode. It is so so fucking mundane, and yet it's arguably the single greatest 20 minutes of television ever produced. That's what's hard. Anyone can do this, but it takes something truly special to make this interesting. Because you're trusting your audience to be intelligent enough to not get bored if you don't have something explode every 30 seconds. That takes risk. With good stories, you need to take risk. Risks. And I feel like the only risk Vivi took is with its budget. It's good to have such high concept, high budget shit going on. Great even. Goddamn stellar even. Seriously. I cannot praise this show's production highly enough because it looks and sounds better than literally everything on this list besides- Well, we'll get to that one. But for how amazing and unique Vivi is, it feels like the kind of paint by numbers story that Marvel squirts out several times a year. Better, obviously, and still thoroughly entertaining, but a special kind of disappointing because it's just not the masterpiece I feel it easily could have been. I know what you're thinking. Jumping into a photograph, Mario 64 already beat that horse to death like 30 years ago. And yeah, I mean, sure, I guess. But my main problem with Link Click is actually, well, wait. First, let me tell you about a book I recently read called Kohi ga Same na Uchi ni, which roughly translates to Before the Coffee Cools. It's the story of a cafe with a table that lets you revisit a single moment in the past. There are five rules. One, you cannot meet someone who has never been to this cafe. Two, no matter what you do, the present will never change. Three, you can only sit in the chair when the previous customer stands up. Four, when you visit the past, you cannot leave this seat. And five, you can stay in the past only so long as the coffee is still hot. And the question the book poses is, what's the point? Would you visit this cafe, visit that one moment? Why go to the past if you know nothing will change? And the answer each of the characters comes to as they leap into the past, clinging to their own little fragments of regret, is that even if the past can never change, the human heart can. And I think this is a question that isn't explored enough in time travel stories. Sure, the past, the future, time, maybe it can change, but what if it can't? Do your actions still matter if the outcome is the same? What is it that gives our lives meaning? When our time has come and gone, will it be what we accomplished or how we live that's meaningful? And I think that's an answer we each have to come to on our own. So there's one arc in Link Click that deals with this exact question. And my problem is that it is by far the best part of the story. The two leads work as PIs, using photos to stealthily jump into fragments of the past and look for information. And this time, unlike every other leap into the past, instead of trying to not change it, they're trying to change it, but only this one 
thing. Anything else that changes could unravel the future and leave it completely unrecognizable. And the rub here is that Zhao Zhu does start changing the past in different ways. He can't help but start doing things that he isn't supposed to. And you're waiting for him to stop, but he just keeps going and going, erasing any chance of undoing what he changed. And you keep waiting for some twist, for some dramatic moment where he horribly and irrevocably screws up the past and ejects the story into madness. But the twist never comes, because they realize in this moment, for reasons I won't spoil, none of it really matters. And so the question this brings up is, why did they even bother? Why were they muddling around in the past if they knew that none of it matters? What difference does it make if the end result is the same? So that just made me think, why isn't this the story? Not all this other big brain detective stuff. Not that it's bad, far from it. The rest of it is still really, really good. Just that this bit is so much better. Instead, it takes this time travel stuff and sets it up for what is looking to be a really, really whack wizard narrative with just the faint aroma of stupid. I'll be watching because I am still very intrigued, but the reason this hasn't placed higher on this list is because like Vivi, I have a feeling that it could just be so, so much more than it is. When you or I think of time travel stories, we think of Steinsgate. But in Japan, you might think of the girl who leapt through time because it's been adapted, would you believe, fucking nine times from the original book written in 1965. And the anime was made in 2006, only three years before Steinsgate. So this was very, very much at the forefront of the writer's minds. So when Daru suggests the male that leapt through time as the name for D-males, this is why. Because despite Despite, or even because of being so old, wink wink, almost every anime on this list could learn a thing or two from it. Instead of being some highbrow intellectual fable, it's a mundane story about an extremely ordinary and very stupid high school girl. <laughs> So when she accidentally stumbles upon the power to leap through time, instead of using her powers to do anything grand or potentially dangerous, she uses it to extend her karaoke time for free, to eat the same pudding again, to catch all of her friends' baseball hits, just all of the most completely inane shit. I keep praising Steinsgate for, despite being so intelligent and grandiose, never getting lost in all of that because stories are never about the things that happen. They're about the characters those things happen to. So the question the girl who leapt through time asks is, what if we took the most complicated and philosophical concept in fiction, time travel, and went absolutely nowhere with it? And it's goddamn brilliant. One thing you might notice is that when she starts leaping with determination rather than just screwing around for some reason, she starts jumping upstairs. What? Why the hell would you run upstairs and jump up? What an idiot. And when the story escalates, instead of being more serious, she only starts using her powers for even stupider shit. It's really funny, and yet still manages to be very coherent and thoughtful. If I had one criticism that's keeping it out of A tier, it's that I feel there's still room to be more than it is. The reason Steins Gate is so meaningful is because it's rooted in the everyday and uses this to explore so much of what it really means to be human. But this movie is maybe just slightly too comfortable where it is. But being that the only real criticism I have for this movie is that it isn't Steins Gate, I feel like this deserves its spot at the top of B tier because it's what you'd call a bona fide hood classic. Mama was you know, after my utterly visceral reaction to Mirai no Mirai, I thought maybe I'm the problem and that I just hate kids. Well, turns out there's hope yet for the royal weeaboo lineage because Mama is a fourth grader is really, really good. Which is weird because they're more similar than you think. I mean, both babies are named Mirai, but I guess that's just because Japanese people for some reason need to drop their IQ by double digits anytime names come into the picture. Oh, I see. Your name means light, but it's written with the kind 
Kanji from Moon, and what's this? Your last name means God of the Night? I'm sorry, I don't think I quite got the symbolism there. Could you spell it out maybe a little more fucking literally? Mama as a fourth grader is another saccharine story with an oddly dark setup where the parents just abandon a 10 year old when they move to London for her father's job. Oh, sorry baby, we only have two plane tickets, but don't worry, your father's lackey will come take you to the airport tomorrow. Bitch, what? You have two plane tickets and you make the kids sit out, not the woman. Hello? Of course no one comes because this is, as far as I can tell, a ruse to abandon their kid, Natsumi, as well as the dog who she finds wandering around alone in the park instead of in the care of family friends like they said. Brother, Batman's origin story wasn't this dark. Sure, the mom comes back and tries to take Natsumi to London with her a few <clears throat> months later, but when she apparently agrees to let her 10 year old stay in Japan to take care of a baby because she thinks Natsumi just really doesn't want to go to London, you start to get a little suspicious that the poor kid has undergone some minor gaslighting at some point. At least they made arrangements for that house in the care of Izumi, Natsumi's selfish and childish aunt struggling to become a published manga artist, who she now has to live with and suddenly raise a child together when her future baby time slips 15 years to the past in the middle of a lightning storm. Okay, so while Mirai no Mirai screws up by making you hate every single one of the characters, especially the kid, baby Mirai is probably the most well-written character in this anime. I've never seen so much personality from a character who can't even talk or make any sounds other than for that matter. And it's not that she never gets upset or cries, but even when she does, she somehow never stops being utterly adorable. But she's not just cute. The show never forgets who the star of the story is. It's not Auntie Izumi, it's not Mommy, or any of the other characters. It's the baby. Not just her relationship with Natsumi and how it grows over the course of the story, but her very existence warps every every single other character around her and makes them each want to be a better person because she is the most important thing in the world. Even the world's most cynical person, and believe me I speak from experience, will completely fall in love with her because she is everything cute and lovable about babies times a million. And on top of this, Mama as a fourth grader is really really funny. While it always makes sure to stop and punch your feels in the dick every once in a while, it's never so serious that it forgets that it's about a future baby that time traveled through a TV to be raised by two 10 year olds with only one of them being old enough to drink. But even though none of the characters even once stops feeling like children, they're all just so, so extremely likable. And again, a big part of this is Mirai because when it comes down to it, each of them is willing to step up and at least try to be an adult for the sake of the baby. And well, how the story plays out should be extremely obvious, like two episodes in. I don't think I even need to tell you what happens to Izumi. I mean, her character couldn't be more author self-insert if it were her fucking dildo. It's just so touching to watch all these characters grow together as it gets easier to care for the baby while simultaneously harder to inevitably say goodbye. There's a few, well, more than a few, well, okay, a lot of problems with the premise, but at its heart, this is a a really mature story about a girl trying to grow up faster than she's able to, and a woman being forced to grow up faster than she wants to. Honestly, I was worried this would really suck, because at 51 episodes, not only is this the longest anime on this list, unless you count Higurashi and its horrible sequel and all the irrelevant OVAs I had to watch but weren't interesting or bad enough to talk about, making me wonder why I even bothered in the first place, a Japanese cartoon about a little girl raising a baby written in the early 90s that no one has ever heard of is not something I would have ever chosen to watch. But I'm glad I did because what I found is easily one of, if not the single best sitcom I've ever seen. Eightia. Masterpiece. Okay, now that we're getting into the really, truly mind-bendingly, coke-snortingly good shit, we can tone down the sarcasm a little bit. Can, but won't. Well, not yet anyway. Don't do drugs, by the way, kids. If you want to experience new sensations, do these enemy instead, because this is the kind of shit you might call art. Each a masterpiece, a standout gem floating around in a pool, or let's be honest, this is anime, an ocean of fucking pests. Yojohanshinwa where did my life go so wrong is something you probably ask yourself regularly if you spent the last five months watching literally every time travel anime ever made like the idiot you are. But it's stories like this that make it all worth it because this is the question at the heart of the Tatami Galaxy, which is... 
artsy would be one way to describe it. So pretentious that it has its head far enough up its own ass to come back out and suck its own dick would be another. But there's a damn good reason this made it all the way up to A tier because pretentiousness is generally a sad excuse for a lack of substance. And the genius part about the Tatami Galaxy is that all of this is being told through the main character who is this idiot who maniacally overanalyzes and over explains the most violently irrelevant little details of his precious little life, pretending this gives him some semblance of control over his sad, ordinary existence. In every episode, he explores what would happen if he made what he thinks are less terrible choices, but every time his life ends up exactly the same because what's wrong isn't these irrelevant choices, but who he is as a person. So the one lacking substance isn't the story, but rather he himself. Let me tell you about my favorite book of all time, Scott Pilgrim. Scott is a really, really shitty person. He doesn't mean to be, he genuinely tries to be good, but he's just so inept that he doesn't understand how to not be so shitty. And that's because at every point in his life when he's faced with failure, he runs from it. And so he never gets a chance to learn from his mistakes. As a result, he's a bum. His life sucks, he sucks, and all of his friends actually hate him. And there's a point where, again running from his own failures, he finally has to come face to face with them in the form of the Nega Scott. And when he defeats it, all of his failures, all his suppressed memories come racing back to him and he's finally able to move on from them. Not right away, but slowly, step by step, he starts learning to be a better person. And that's the message that Tatami Galaxy wants to get across. Instead of learning from his mistakes and focusing on the future and what kind of person he could be, the unnamed protagonist of the Tatami Galaxy focuses on the past and what his life would be like if he could change something he never ever had the power to, and as a result his life ends up exactly the same every single time. And he's unnamed because he's you, motherfucker! You could be so, so many different things, but if you keep getting hung up on the past, instead of learning from it, if you keep resenting your own place in the world instead of accepting it, there's no way you could ever become any of them. The Tatami Galaxy is a deeply, deeply introspective story. Pretentious, yes, but it both passes and utterly obliterates the pretentiousness rule at the exact same time. You know, despite being the king of weeaboos, it blows my mind every time I realize there's people who actually think Japanese high school is some magical paradise where the world's sexiest people do world-shattering things every single day. Newsflash, anime lied to you. It is just as boring and sad as in your country, and if you went there, you'd only get shoved into your locker twice as often because you're a cringy weeaboo who barely has has the social skills to avoid starving to death. But maybe you would be slightly less of a weeaboo if you watched- Wait, I'm sorry, one of the most insightful reflections on Japanese society ever written is called Teenage Pig Does Not Dream of Bunny Girl Senpai? Okay, fuck me, I guess. But maybe this message was aimed at the people who most need to hear it, because Japan has this concept that Westerners don't really think about called reading the air. You might think of the air as the fabric of society, the invisible force existing between and binding together every single one of us. And being able to read the air means being able to fit in, to go with the flow and not stand out, and to understand what it means to live up to the expectations of the world around you. And because Japanese society is such a cohesive whole, because the needs of the group come before the individual, the ability to read the air is one of the key things you need to learn to not be such a fucking weeaboo. So the protagonist, Sakura, is someone who can perfectly read the air, but chooses to ignore it. To him, why would he give a shit? Why would it matter what everyone else thinks when you would be happier just being your own person? Why would you waste your time trying to live up to the expectations of people you barely know and care even less about? But then he meets legendary actor Mai, who is so famous and successful that she doesn't just read the air, she becomes it. She is the heir. And so when the high school heir is too afraid to even try to get close to the untouchable Sakura Jima Mai, too afraid to so much as acknowledge her existence, she starts disappearing for real. So Mai is a complete contradiction of Sakura's whole life because the heir is who Mai is as a person, and if that's what's making her disappear, how can he reconcile this? How can you fight something that does not 
and cannot really exist. And to answer this, I actually just want to read a passage from the book because you should all go and read this too. みんなが。What Sakura realizes is that by choosing to ignore the air, he's just taking the path of least resistance, making him no different than everyone else. He is, in his own way, still disappearing into the masses, still becoming a part of everyone. But what does everyone even mean anyway? What he learns is the only way to transcend the air is not to ignore it, but to fight it. And the only way to fight it is to become it, to direct the fabric of society around yourself and your actions. To be not one person lost in a crowd of hundreds, thousands of people, but to be the center of that crowd, to bridge the irony between the one thing he most despises and the one thing he most admires to stand up and be an individual. So when I tell you that this is just the first part of Bunny Girl Senpai, you might get an inkling of why I think this anime is so fucking good. Every character struggles with their role in society, battles the question of how to accept your own flaws and imperfections and love yourself for who you are while striving to be the person you're meant to be. The entire story is written around these quasi-scientific discussions of the magical elements of the show called Puberty Syndrome, which invoke the quantum physics property of the observer. Not because any of it is actually supposed to be what's happening, but because it's exactly this that creates the fabric of society. It's everyone observing themselves and everyone else, and how everyone else in turn observes them. It's not that we think, no. It's that we observe, therefore we are. Bunny Girl Senpai is a must watch, not just for everyone who wants to understand Japanese society, but for anyone struggling with their own place in the world. The characters aren't just deep, but the way they talk and move and think is so natural and so witty. Most of the show is just people talking, but it's so well written that every single line is utterly absorbing. To anyone who's never seen it, I highly recommend it. And to everyone who has, do yourself a favor and pick up the first light novel. It's outstanding. Jipangu. Hey, wait a second, so-called king of weeaboos. I thought you weren't including any isekai-type time travel stories. Well, for one, this is far more interesting than all of the wank further down, and also it's my list, so fuck you. But the real reason I'm including Jipangu is because they aren't being sent to the distant past or future. They're being sent to the very recent past, and it's about how their actions have very real and very immediate effects on the present. Jipang is about this Japanese battleship caught up in a storm and time warped to the Battle of Midway in 1942 where the crew realizes that they could single-handedly change the outcome of the war and alter history forever and decide not to interfere. Now, if this sounds a lot like the movie The Final Countdown, you'd be right, but the difference with Jipang is that, well, for one, Jipang doesn't suck, but also this lasts about as far as the second episode when they sail past sinking warships with thousands of men, only to come across a single downed plane with a single survivor and save his life. This reminds me of an old quote from Stalin in Red Alert. When you kill one, it is a tragedy. When you kill 10 million, it is a statistic. <laughs> this is the exact opposite of that. It's easy to overlook the thousands of lives being cast aside in war, to act righteous in the face of history, but can you look a single man in the face and sentence him to death? So the crew of the Mirai realizes that there is no returning to the time they came from, but still vow to influence the future as little as possible to protect the life and the world they know. But the man they save, Kusaka, upon visiting the ship's library and learning how the future unfolds, offers them a different perspective. Why were they even sent back in time in the first place? Perhaps they were sent to the past for a reason. The old future will disappear, but their presence already makes that impossible, so surely it would be negligent of them to not now use their knowledge to forge a better, brighter future from the mistakes of the past. It's an answer to the belief in time travel that the present is something sacred, something that should be protected at all costs. 
Why? Because some people might not be born? History isn't fate or destiny or anything that was supposed to happen. It's merely a series of events that did happen and that very well could have happened differently at any point in time. So why exactly is the present something we should protect? Each of us is, by our very existence, changing the outcome of the future, so why would knowledge of what's to come really be any different? Sure, some kids screaming racial slurs over Call of Duty won't have been born, but what about all the millions of casualties of war? What about their unborn children and grandchildren? What about all the kids that could have fucked your mom? Who's to say their lives are any more or less valuable just because things happen differently? All of our lives are merely the consequences of our collective actions as humanity. Nothing more and nothing less. So while on one hand, the men of the battleship Mirai are able to look upon this period objectively from a time of peace, on the other, their worldview is biased towards the future, towards merely one outcome of the war. Whereas Kusaka, as a man of the present, has no such biases. While the Mirai sees the future how it was, Kusaka sees the future how it could be. They see themselves as objective observers from outside this time, but in reality, their perspective is the most biased of all. Before watching Jipangu, I'd never really thought about the concept of history as a philosophy, but this is exactly the kind of thing I look for in an A-tier anime, something that shapes how I see the world. Now, if there's one complaint I have about it, it's that, well, I don't know whether to call this a complaint or not, but the second half of the manga never got adapted for season two, so it's kind of like not finished. Can I really hold this against it though, that the very realistic Japanese World War II story with the underlying message that Japan really should not have gotten involved in the war and needed to be humiliated as a country and that basically has zero titties was not popular enough to warrant the season two? I don't know, I'll leave that one up to you. But anyway, while you technically could consider this an isekai type buttfuck as one of the most profound anime I've ever seen, it easily deserves its spot all the way up in A tier, not only succeeding in its philosophy, but as a war story showing us every single character is not a number, not a story, but a person who cast aside their life for the folly of their fellow man. If you've only experienced World War II through movies made by white people glorifying killing Nazis and destroying fascism with facts and logic, I highly encourage you to watch Jipango because there is nothing else like it. Where do I even begin with one of the most stunningly surreal and subversive works of animation ever conceived? How about with something you haven't thought nearly enough about? Have you noticed how very industrial the world of Madoka Magica is? What's with all the pipes and the turbines and the factories? And what's with the cars? No, seriously, what's with the cars? Let's back up. What even is a magical girl? It's the purity and spirit of youth manifest into this hyper-sexualized type of superhero. And just like the industry eating away at the natural world, creating this false, idyllic sense of nature with its neatly trimmed riverbanks, the magical girl is a perversion of this youth, capturing something natural and beautiful and transforming it into a neatly sterile and manufactured product for consumption. So instead of being about this girl who gains superpowers and saves the world, it's about her being protected from those superpowers as Akemi tries again and again to stop Madoka from forming a pact to become a magical girl. Because magic in this world comes from emotion and the people with the strongest and fiercest emotions, full of hope and despair, are young girls, each a bottled flame burning brightly before the tempering and maturity of age, instead being smashed to pieces to become a dying supernova of youth. Why do you think their classrooms are made of glass? Because they're on display. All of these girls, all of them, are something to be seen desired, consumed. The magical girls exist to consume the grief and despair of the world, and it in turn consumes them as they burn up their youth and exhaust into a sinking pit of despair themselves. Magical girls hunt witches, hunt monsters, but when we learn that witches are the inevitable end of a magical girl's life, this leaves the question of who the real monsters in this story are. Is it the cute and fuzzy magical girl incubators, or is it us? 
You know, this reminds me a lot of the reality show 16 with JYP, the one that produced TWICE. It's a fascinating look into the K-pop industry, how it takes these young girls' hopes and dreams and chews them up and spits them out for profit. And what it shows us is that the reason K-pop is so successful is because despite being so manufactured, what we get is the most endearing and authentic performers out there because they're simply passionate young girls chasing their dreams, fueling an industry that exists by devouring the hopes and dreams of youth. And yes, these dreams are beautiful and delicious, but there's something very, very wrong with the idea that they're what make a person valuable, that there's something to be plucked and harvested like ripe fruit. And yet we've barely questioned this as we sit back and consume. Here's the thing about stories. We can sit here all day and dream about time travel and space and the universe. Dream about the grandiose, but those things are only meaningful to us because they would be meaningful to us. Stories aren't meaningful because they're grandiose. Stories are meaningful because they're personal. And Madoka Magica pulls back the curtain on the grandiose and shows us the beauty and the sorrow of ordinary little girls with ordinary grandiose dreams. And it's this very idea of a dream that Madoka struggles with. Forming a contract to become a magical girl means being granted a wish for something, anything, and that chance should make her the luckiest person in the world. But her life is already perfect. She has loving parents, a good home, and good friends. What more could she possibly ask for? Just like Okabe in Steins Gate, what each of these girls sacrifices to become a magical girl is the idyllic, perfect, boring every day as they are wrapped up in the endless cycle of consume, consume, consume. Yes, what better metaphor for capitalism is there than the magical girl? And this isn't even getting into the art and sound direction. I'm a fan of almost everything Gen Odebuchi has ever made, see my video on Psychopaths, but he and his team have seriously outdone themselves with this one. The witches are these hauntingly surrealist, almost nonsensical, childlike manifestations of despair, and the soundtrack is this rhapsody of emotion and melancholy that perfectly captures the perverted hopes and dreams of teenage girls. If The Girl Who Leapt Through Time is what you'd call a bona fide hood classic, Madoka Magica is what you would call a work of fucking art, and I suspect it will be remembered far, far into the future, and maybe that was the real time travel all along. Estia. So now, finally after some good anime, but mostly a lot of fucking bullshit, we get to my personal favorite anime. Stories that were so memorable that they stuck with me for a long, long time after watching them. And while I don't think there's anything else I could talk about for seven hours like Steins Gate, dear god what's wrong with me, there is one other anime I love maybe just as much. Yeah, if you're at all familiar with my work, you probably saw this one coming. I love this anime. I've seen it like 10 times, and I'll probably see it another 10 more times. Not that it's perfect, but this is the rare story where I honestly can't think of a single thing I'd change about it. Seriously, it's that good. Not that you'd hear that from director Shinkai Makoto. He sees this movie as unfinished, having run out of budget to make the movie he really wanted to. But here's the thing, it's in chasing perfection that you lose sight of what's really important in a story and end up with something less. Or, in the case of George Lucas, ruining something you already had. Shinkai's next movie, Weathering With You, I guarantee you he had basically unlimited budget for it, and it's honestly kind of forgettable. Suzume no Tojimari was better, great even, but it still felt like it was missing something. Kimi no Nawa, on the other hand, is one of the most unforgettable stories ever produced. Surprisingly hard to tell you why without spoiling it though, because on paper it might sound super lame. Okay, imagine, Japanese Freaky Friday, but it's a love story. Uh, okay, that sounds... Fun, I guess? No, no, well, yes, but it's also one of the most heart-wrenchingly emotional stories ever written. You said Freaky Friday, right? I did. Uh-huh. It's a movie about connection, about the past and future, about love, about family, about tradition, about the human heart. It's a movie about having somewhere and something and someone to belong to. It's about finding your place in the world, about being true to yourself. It's about searching for something you don't quite understand, but no. 
know is real. Did I mention it's about love? Every character in every place in this movie just feels so real and so authentic. It's so funny and yet so emotional and so fantastical and despite taking place halfway across the world, everything about it feels so at home. I don't think everyone should watch all my favorite anime, not even Steinsgate, no matter how good they are, because nothing is going to appeal to everyone. Except Kimi no Nawa. Everything about this movie is just so universal to the human condition. There is a reason literally almost everyone in Japan has seen this. Seriously, if you don't love this movie, I feel like there must be something wrong with you and hmm, time travel. You didn't even mention how this relates to time travel. No. No, I guess I didn't. If you haven't seen it, you're better off going in blind. Not that the plot is all that crazy or anything, it's just that it's better if you let it catch you off guard. But, I mean, who gives a shit, really? Time travel? Isekai? Mecha? These don't really mean anything, they're just frameworks for stories. Stories aren't frameworks. Stories are about the human heart, and that is universal. Steinsgate. You know, I was just gonna pass on this and point you to my hours and hours of Steinsgate analysis, but then I realized I've never actually sat down and done a proper review. But if I'm being honest, you should maybe just skip this and go to those videos if you want to hear me talk about it though, because anything I could possibly say is gonna be absolutely, positively drenched in cum. Not the horrible yellow weeaboo spooge like all of the terrible anime on this list, rather the glistening, majestic seed of the king of weeaboos, but Come nonetheless, Steinsgate is about a bunch of autistic kids that invent a time machine by accident with a cell phone and a microwave. And while that sentence should have sold it to you if you're even the slightest bit cool, for some reason, a lot of people think the beginning is slow. Yeah, sure, I guess if your expectation from anime is two morons staring at each other and yelling for 20 minutes only interrupted by the occasional titty bounce, I guess it could be considered slow. But if you're someone who enjoys watching horror of horrors, characters sitting down to talk like actual fucking people, you'd probably like it because they're just so goddamn funny. Steinsgate tackles all this fantastical shit about time and space and the universe, but it never, ever forgets that stories are not about the universe. Stories are about characters, they're about people, they're about us. Steinsgate at its heart is a story about loneliness. It's about a bunch of kids who come together because their only desire is to be loved by someone. This isn't a story about time travel, it simply uses it to share with us the fantastical beauty of the everyday. Because it's about friendship. It's about treasuring all the little moments in between that we take for granted. And all of the stuff about infinity and the universe is only there to contrast these moments, to lift the story up so it can bring it crashing down to Earth just a little harder. When I think of love stories, I don't think of Romeo and Juliet or Titanic or whatever nauseatingly vapid soccer mom level bukkake is popular this month. I think of Steinsgate, not just because the two leads are positively dripping with chemistry as a pair of probably autistic geniuses that can't help but butt heads every time they're together, but because like everything else in this story, it revolves around the little things that make life worth living. Maybe this won't mean anything to you if you've never seen it, but I want to share with you my favorite quote from any story ever. Somehow, being almost violently intelligent only makes this story even more human. And yeah, if you've seen it, you probably were thinking if there's one thing this tier list needs, it's several more hours of me talking about this one anime. Because, haha, no, I wasn't kidding. You'll find a link to my in-depth analysis playlist, not to be confused with my other Steinsgate playlist, yes, I have more than one, in about 10 seconds. This has been quite a long video though, so before I go, I don't know how productive the literal months I spent writing and rewriting every single one of these reviews is going to be for whatever black magic goes into YouTube's algorithm. So if you enjoyed it, please, please do me a favor and step on the like button and consider sharing it with your cooler friends. As always, thank you so much for your time, friends, and I will see you in the next video.